was impossible to get home to do. What was the, Norman, do you know what the ambulance fund gift, who that was for? In, in, that was Cobra. In the name of? I don't believe, one second. It did not specify who. Uh, it was it's simply, yeah, it's simply. Just a gift. It's just a gift. Maybe they were just a happy customer. Yeah, yeah. Which we'll take. Yeah. Welcome to the uh, Board of Selectmen meeting here at uh, Tuesday, December 19th. Um, we actually opened uh, an executive session a little while ago um, to discuss uh, the uh, strategies respect to bargain, collective bargaining updates and um, town managers raise and uh, I guess that's about it. And the fire, and the fire, fire chiefs. Um, so uh, we're now in executive. We're now out of executive session, and uh, let's start by uh, the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So first we're going to go with the uh, public session. If uh, residents are invited to share ideas, opinions, or ask questions <coughs> regarding town government, anybody want to come up? No. We have such a great audience today, too. I was hoping. Okay. We'll jump right to the consent agenda. We'll consider, um, uh, we're going to put a hold on the uh, 12 5 17 to give some updates. Uh, the gifts Board of Scotland will consider accepting the following gifts and ambulance fund donation from Lois Coburn of 39 Forest Lane Hopkins to the amount of $100. Um, and uh, the Board of Scotland will consider the marathon fund request for the Hopkins High School girls lacrosse teams for $800 for the purchase of 50 pennies for JV and varsity girls lacrosse. And the Friends of Hill of Hockey, $3,000 for renting a locker room for one year at the New England Sports Center for equipment for the Hopkinton High School boys ice hockey team. So uh, I guess since there's only two, we'll break the two of them out. Uh, the, the minutes we're, we're, we're putting off until we have the, uh, we need an update on them. So we'll, we'll give us up the, uh, the January 16th meeting. Um, so I'd like to break out the ambulance fund. Uh, donation. I'd like to break out the marathon fund requests. Excellent. I can break out both of them. Thank you. So much for the consent to Jim. Uh, <laughs> hey, Brendan, take us away. So, this is kind of the thing that I talk about historically is the ambulance fund gift, and it's nice to see uh, Lois Colburn um, donate in, in the amount that she did. Uh, that money goes to a great great fund and it, it's generated uh, it's generated from a Hopkin in person and it goes to Hopkin um, you know the betterment of our of our fire department and, and, uh, and medic crew so uh, thank you to Lois Coburn for the amount of uh, money that she donated so uh, the chair requests a motion to accept the donation to the ambulance funds from Lois Coburn so moved Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Um, this is the story. Marathon fund requests. Yeah, and the marathon fund requests. Um, you know, typically we see a listing of past requests: uh, who got what, when. Um, I know that, and, and I'm not faulting him for this at all. I know that the, uh, the hockey team at the high school is uh, a frequent um, a requestor, I guess, I guess uh, of, of those funds. And we've helped them quite a bit. And, you know, again, I don't have any problem with that. But I'm just wondering, this locker room rental, 
I'm wondering exactly what that is. I mean, is this something that happens every year? Uh, is this something above and beyond what they do for the normal hockey season? Does it go throughout the hockey season? How does it usually get paid? Um, I know that the kids, the kids pay an athletic fee. Um, I would think that that would take care of all the facilities uh, and facility uh, you know, payments that need to be made. So I'm just wondering what this is exactly. So I can jump into what this is, Histor you know, um, kind of industry-wide. Um, so when this has nothing to do with the athletic fees, this has nothing to do, this isn't anything that's a, a must for the hockey team, but I can tell you to be able to have a locker room where they store their stuff, it's a permanent locker room, they don't have to set up before every game, before every practice. Uh, they don't have to carry their stuff to school. They don't have to try to store it in school or in their cars. Um, to have an actual home locker room at your rink is um, it is such an added bonus. And, and it's hard to compare it to some of the other sports because basketball is played at the high school. Baseball is played at the high school. So this is something that they're not going to have to lug everything back and forth, they get their training supplies there, they're, they, they're able to air out their equipment, uh, there's a training table in there where the trainer can go in and work on you. It, it's a whole, basically a home base <coughs> at, the, uh, at the sports center or wherever they're going to be playing. Um, so it's for $3,000, you know, I, I particularly, as someone who has played hockey, um, it's such an incredible um, luxury to have to have your team there, and and to, I mean to have all your gear there, and not have to bring it. And your skate sharpeners there, and it's just a, it's what so kind of what so the industry yeah. I guess so. Do. So my, one of my questions, and we probably can't get it answered tonight, is is this going to be a recurring request annually? I would think that if this is the route, I mean they're not going to buy a locker room. At, at the rink. So in order to have this, it would be an annual, I would say it would be an annual expense. I don't know if the annual expense would necessarily have to come from the marathon, but this is the first time that they're able to do that. And no, and I'm wondering if it's going to be an annual request of the marathon. Well, it's, it's, if, if I may, you guys, the, the, um, these requests come to the marathon fund, uh, mm -hmm. marathon fund committee. I'm on, I'm on that committee. A and they come in front of the marathon fund committee and, and, and answer all of these questions. And so, but by the time it comes to us, these, you know, each of these requests are vetted. Okay, so maybe you can give us the answers then. On the... Is this going to be coming to they, us every I, year? I, I don't know that answer. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be. Uh, but, uh, you know, but, you know, this... I just, I just don't see, I guess this is my point. I don't see the marathon, the marathon fund as being the place to be paying... Um, an expense that's recurring, you know, year after year after year um, for a particular sport. I mean, the uniforms and, you know, the new bags for the hockey equipment, things like that, you know, I understand that 100%. And, you know, that stuff happens once every whatever, whatever whether it's three years mm -hmm. or eight years, whatever. Um, but it's, I, I don't, the, the purpose of the Marathon Fund is not to be, uh, uh, basically supplementing the operational budget. It's my understanding this is a new venue for hockey this year, mm -hmm. a new rink with a new, a new home ice, I believe. I'm not sure uh, with this new opportunity. So I agree with you. Um, from my perspective, I think based on the fact that it's been vetted through Marathon Fund, uh, I would support it. But going forward, I would have that question. Uh, I'd be interested in the answer to that question about whether this should be operational or not. And to your point. But I do think it's a different space, and that's what created this situation. To, to your point, I see that they're playing at the New England Sports Center, which is that eight rank complex off of 290 at 495. Right. Where I think historically, since the inception of the program, <coughs> uh, they've been playing at the Navin rink, which right. is on 85, right by the police station. Navin does not have the ability or the space to offer this. Right. So if this is this is their first year there, if they're offered a... Uh, so that also tells me that they've been doing fine without that. Well, yeah, a lot of teams <laughs> do fine without it. Yeah, I mean, I would just also ask, 
sometimes we've seen a whole sheet of the marathon fund expenditures and how much ha they have, and I can't remember what it is. Um, I'd be interested to know how much money right now is available in the marathon fund and if this is kind of in line with some of those expenditures because it is a, it is a good chunk of money. I mean, it's not, you know, the several hundred dollar requests that we've sometimes seen. It's, it's three grand. And then with the thought that is this going to be three grand every year um, to use that facility, that is something to think about. Maybe I agree I'd, I would support it this year, but going forward, um, you know, it it seems like that's a, a big chunk out of the available marathon funds for one, one entity um, for an annual thing. Um, See, now I don't want to look like a, you know, have us see what people think that we're a rubber stamp, and obviously we're not with because there's some dissent. Um, but uh, again, the Marathon Fund Committee is there. You know, there's a nice group of people, dedicated group of people that, that do listen to these things and and, uh, and do vet them. When they come to us there, they, they get they get lots of these. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you, know, it, it, if, you know, if we want to you know, listen to all of them, <coughs> we can, but that's why we do have that committee. And they bring us the ones that they think that, uh, that are viable. Yeah, there's <coughs> nobody's nobody's questioning how nice the people are, and no. you know that they're that they're trying to do the right thing. But um, you know, it's also it, it, to your point, this isn't a rubber stamp, mm -hmm. so it is within our authority to question this. And um, you know, certainly letting letting this letting this go through one year, and it's the inaugural year at this place. I understand that, but. Um, you know, this isn't this isn't the fund for operational expenditures. <coughs> oh boy. Okay, with that, the uh, just for the record, yes. if I may, the the balance in the marathon fund as of November third uh, is twenty nine thousand two hundred and forty five dollars thirteen cents. Um, do you also have? Well, it doesn't matter. How much was that again? Twenty nine thousand two hundred and forty five thirteen cents. Okay, does anybody have any uh, questions about the, uh, the, the cross pennies? Okay. Well, can I just ask Mr. Kamala one more question on these marathon fund requests? Um, do you have available access to, you know, how much the requests have historically been? Is, is a four-figure, you know, especially if we're thinking this might be an ongoing expense, I don't want one group to be, you know, getting a large quantity of the funds to the detriment of other smaller groups that tend to have one-time expenses like these usually are. Are there, well, are there historically uh, requests in the thousands? I mean, this seems like yes. a large request. Yes. yes. I, think, I think if you look historically, the hockey team, at least, at least every two years, you know, they're requesting something. And again, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, that's fine. That's fine. It's that's what fine. the money's there for. They're yeah. making the requests. I don't mm -hmm. see them coming through from others. You know, it's not like yeah. they're fighting for funds that no. somebody else is asking for. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the the fund does. They do benefit well from the fund at mm -hmm. this point. And I would hate to see this become a recurrent thing. And I think they started out as a club. And as a club, you know, they didn't have the same funding coming through the budget process. Uh, and I think that's where they historically started coming to Marathon Fund for mm -hmm. funding. Um, and then it evolved into varsity and so on. So, I, I mean, I, I will also say as a family who's been engaged in skating, skating of any sort is an expensive sport. And you don't have the same kind of school facilities available to you that you do when you're doing track or softball or football. Um, you got to buy ice. The equipment's expensive. So I have lots of sympathy for, for ice-related sports, that they're at a different level of expenditures for the families that are involved. So I, I completely <laughs> I have a lot of sympathy in, okay. in that. Okay. So with that, the chair will request a motion to approve the marathon fund request for the Hotton High School girls lacrosse teams and the Friends of Hill Hockey. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, how do you vote? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? It passes. Okay. Um, next up. Hopkins.
Agricultural Council appointments. The Board of Selectmen will consider the appointments of Lara Stacy, Kelly Haggerty, Jonathan Melzer, and Richard Jacobs to Hopkinton Cultural Council to terms expiring June 30th, 2020. Uh, Mr. Kamala, could you uh, um, bring me up to speed on this one? Now, this is, it's funny, we, we had one person for Cultural Council a few weeks ago, and I don't remember anybody ever before and now we get <laughs> not that, it's a great thing that we have people coming up but all of a sudden it's just it's funny a, a, a group that meets once a year all of a sudden we uh, we're getting a whole bunch <laughs> yes through the chair I, I, I think perhaps that is reflective of a couple of things one um, that we're continuing to advertise vacancies um, widely uh, through the town website and other social media uh, secondly at its most recent review uh, of an application to this council, the board publicly discussed that the, the membership of this committee uh, can range uh, mm. between a minimum of five and a maximum of 22 members. And I think that, that's, that could be the reason why we, we have this very robust response. Uh, from the residents. Like, that sounds yes. like the Zoning Advisory Committee to yes. 20 members. Yeah. I'd love to see the school committee and the Board of Selectmen have 22 members on each committee. I think that would be great fun. Yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That would free up my Tuesday nights. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> um. okay. so, so, Mr. Kamala, are, are these candidates here? Any of the candidates here? Yes. We have three, three of the three candidates. Yeah. Mr. Chair, I'd be interested in hearing how the, this came about this evening to be on the agenda just a couple weeks after the last time it was on the agenda. I don't remember the last time it was on the agenda before that. That's what I'm just saying. So exactly. something just seems a little off to me. I'm all for it. But I'd like to understand from the candidates how they came to be here this evening. Okay. So Kelly? Kelly Haggerty? I picked the only person that wasn't here. Okay. Okay, Richard Jacobs. Come on up, please. Welcome. Hi. Um, I was at the last meeting, not this one, but the, the HCC meeting. There's about eight members, and I think five were retiring or four. So a uh, call came out in the Hawking Independent, mm -hmm. and uh, we responded, uh, and we don't need any money. <laughs> so so <it's> moved. <laughs> <laughs> when was that meeting? Uh, that meeting was uh, about three weeks ago. Um, so I'm a member of that uh, committee, and I never got notification that there was going to be a meeting. Really? Sorry. I'm not yeah. on the meeting. I'm not on the committee Something yet. Something's so. just a little off here. <laughs> So how did you get to that meeting? Did you see it online or something? It or? was in the Hopkins Indep Independent. Oh, the that, Independent? At that, that, that's the newspaper I think it was in, yeah. Okay. Hmm. Wow. Great. You weren't invited. <laughs> um, Short timer. So, so are you on there must, from us? Must, I'm on it from here, and it says a voting member. It's not a liaison. Um, I missed last year's meeting. Maybe that's why. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, anybody have any questions? Um, this resume sure. certainly is, is yeah, uh, excellent. robust enough to, Beautiful. <laughs> to swing in there. Well, I, I, I can just comment that um, Richard's, a, Dr. Jacobs is a well-kept secret for us here. He, uh, in addition to his being a, a, an MD, and I know he participates in some of the HC, uh, Cultural Arts Alliance, uh, Activities, but I also know he has a his own very strong artistic bent. He's an artist in his own right and volunteers for the HCA, and uh, so I certainly see he would be a, a very good contributing member to this type of a board. So I'm I'm really glad to see Dr. Jacobs step up. Right. I can give him a personal. You want to take him one at a time, or personal you want to do this later? <laughs> one at a time. Yeah, I think that's good. I move that we appoint Richard Jacobs to the Hopkinton Cultural Council for a term expiring June 30th, 2020. Second. And for Thank any you. discussion? Hearing none, how do you vote? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Welcome. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks for reading The Independent. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, so next. Jonathan, come on up. Hello? How you doing? I, I, oh, look at he's, he's orange. I know. Way to go. <laughs> uh, I move. <laughs> Is that good or bad? <laughs> For uh, me, that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Georgetown. <laughs> Got to put Panther down that. Ah, there you go. An yeah. orangeman over here. Right. Oh, really? Right. <laughs> so, excellent. Yeah, dude, thanks. Uh, you know, again, um, so I guess you started also in the Independent. So. I started in the Independent and mentioned that they were looking for, I think, three or four members. And um, it looked like an interesting way to get involved in the town. And I'm interested in the arts and attend a lot of events here, the HCA and so forth. So it looked, looked interesting. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming up. In spite of his education, I move that Jonathan Melzer be appointed to the <laughs> Opportunity Cultural Council. Second. Okay, any further discussion? Hearing none, how do you vote? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Jonathan, thank you. Yeah, thank you also Jonathan. for reading the independent. I'll have to figure out if they were at the same time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't okay. think so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, come on up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yes, sir. Tis the season. Okay. All right. So, so I, I see you, you're not at either of the schools, the, the rivals. So I guess <laughs> I'm great. safe. <laughs> we're up by there in Rochester. Excellent. Of um, of Chang's. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly happy, happy to run the, on the committee. Yep. So I'd like to move that Laura Stacy be appointed to the Cultural Council. Whatever it was, council council, yeah, cultural council. Do we second. Have a second. Any any further questions? Hearing none. How do you vote? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. All right. So, do you want to hold off on um, Kelly? No, I don't think so. You want to just because she's not here doesn't okay. mean. Okay. I just. Yeah. It's not, it's not like we were asking any rigorous questions. Of yeah, I've, okay. I just was curious about how this all happened so quickly in the last couple of meetings, yeah. but if that's how it happened, then yeah. that's good. Excellent. So I'll move to appoint um, Kelly Haggerty to the Cultural Council. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, any further discussion? Hearing none, how do you vote? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, welcome well, Kelly. Beautiful. Okay, we're moving right along. Thanks for coming down to meet us. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Sir, thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks for stepping up, Doug. Okay. Ugh. Next up. Um, now, I, are we school committee athletic fields? Or is, are we, no, no. We're, we're, are we just the one we're. You got a public hearing, right? It's 7 30. 7 30. So, corridor is. Oh, is that a utility pole? Hmm. That'll only be about five minutes. Yeah, that'll be a quickie. Um, which one are we holding off on? No. Later. It's the call here. Well, can't we, okay, can't so we, since the school committee's here, yes. can't we start with that and then at 7.30 just open the public hearing Yeah. And then come back to this okay. rather than having them wait? Yeah, beautiful. Well, no, 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 I, I just don't do it. Those, we were supposed to flip a couple because one of them was running. I didn't know whether it was that one or the corridor. Come on up. The, uh, the school committee athletic field subcommittee will give a brief update to the board of selectmen on the turf fields. Now, we're, yeah, we're not going to make any decisions or, or anything else. This is just an informative to tell us where the project is. I've been instructed to put this here so you can see it on that screen. So I'm not trying to hide it from you. So that's going to work. No, we can see it. Uh, on that Oh, up on the table. Oh, then you can't see me. Well, that's okay. I hope we'll save everyone. Oh, okay. This is what I said. It's trouble. So maybe, sorry, to be honest. Is it that way? Oh, okay. I have this. Thank you, young lady. I have. Jim, what will take up the budget after my chair? Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks for the love. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having us. Um, we wanted to come back just because last year, as you know, we had started a conversation about this project and we had it on our um, capital request as a placeholder. We ended up withdrawing it. We clearly heard your frustration around that project as well as 
the lack of information that you had. So we just wanted to um, come. We've made a lot of progress uh, in moving forward. So we wanted to come and make sure that you have the opportunity to get up to speed on where we are now. Uh, we just left a meeting with CIC and starting a process with them about talking about this and our other capital requests. So I know Dee is actually um, already tardy for our basketball game. So I'll let her oh, give you a okay. quick little overview and then John and I can answer all the financial questions and Dr. McLeod's here as well. So. Sorry that I can't see some of you. And this is Dee King, <laughs> our athletic director, for those of you who have not met her. Hi, everyone. Um, just to echo Jean's sentiment, thanks so much for having us here. Just to explain a little bit about the work we've done and what's sort of driving this project. Um, when I began in this role last June, it became quickly evident that um, Hockington was one of, at that time, three schools in the Tri-Valley League, which was comprised of 11 at the time that did not have a turf field. Um, and we immediately felt the impact of that from my perspective, um, based on our usage numbers, the hours that we need, the number of athletes we have, and the fact that we um, live in New England and the weather implications that that has on our athletic teams and our ability to have practices and play games. Um, and so it was a thought, but then it really came to fruition um, in terms of the need that we had once the spring started and um, we weren't able to host games when we needed to. We were sometimes having kids play five games in a week, which really shouldn't be done from a safety standpoint um, just because of the weather implications. Um, and so for us to be have the ability to extend the day um, with lights and on a turf field that will be easier to maintain and um, it doesn't have obviously the same level of um, uncertainty as a, as a natural turf field and uh, we just felt that it was, it was something that we owed our not just our student athletes certainly but our community as one that uses a, the space specifically at the high school a lot um, but for athletics community events and and such and we thought it was something that was really worth advocating for um, since that time last year, we are now, um, the Thai Valley League has expanded to 12 teams with um, the addition of Dedham and Norwood. Um, and so at this time, Hockington, Millis, and Norton are the only three schools that do not have um, synthetic turf fields. Norton's in the, process, in the same process that we are at this point. Um, so we just, we, we really wanted to get the ball rolling, but um, to Jean's point, making sure that we were doing all of our work and doing it in the right way um, and understand last year the concerns and have really worked this year to address those um, and, and make sure that we have been as thorough as we can in our work. So again, just the driving force being the, the usage, the, the need, um, the extended hours and just safety in general. So um, that's, that's a little bit about the background. Um, and as you can see on the diagram, um, what we're here to talk about tonight is phase one of the project, which would be fields four and five. Um, so can certainly address any questions about that that you might have, but I know Jean wanted to speak a little bit just about the, the work that's been done, the financials and the meetings that, that we've had to date. Yeah, so we have um, spent the last year working with a lot of the other um, committees in town. So we do have approval from CONCOM for both phases of the project. Right now we're just talking about funding phase one, which is the one on the top, fields four and five. Um, we also, um, one of the main reasons that we pulled this article last year is because we weren't ready at the time of the CPC grant application process. And so we did go to CPC this year and we were really very pleased with the result. They have agreed to fund $1.72 million of this project. Um, right now the cost that we're carrying is $3.8 million. We're ready to go out to bid contingent on town meeting approval um, in the middle of January, so we'll have a harder number uh, before we get to town meeting, but that's the ballpark um, that we're in. Um, so we also have spent a great deal of time working with Parks and Rec on the joint management, so this really is meant to be a community asset, not a school asset. So that is the agreement, that that's a draft um, agreement that I just gave to you uh, that we have worked on with Parks and Rec. So basically you'll see there's an o there would be an oversight committee set up which would have representation from the school department as well as from Parks and Rec and the town um, that would oversee the revolving fund as well as maintenance, as well as revenue, as, as well as scheduling. 
Um, and so generally, in broad terms, the schools would have the right of first refusal on the fields until a certain time after school, like 6 o'clock, or it would really be dependent on the schedule, so there would be a meeting um, before each season to talk about the need. Following that, there would be opportunity for community use um, in terms of our local sports teams as well as the opportunity for rentals, um, both in, in the evening as well as on the weekends and then weekend tournaments and whatnot. So we, we really wanted to ensure that this was done in to complement with an E, Parks and Rec not to compete with Fruit Street. And so um, the opportunity to have um, both both fields available in town is very attractive in terms of a revenue standpoint for bringing in outside groups, particularly for tournaments. Um, but you know, most importantly for the schools, it would really solve a critical usage need that we have. We just, as you know, every time you see me, we're talking about <laughs> expanding enrollment, and we have a lot more kids. Um, they're playing a lot of sports. Many of them are three-season athletes, and we just simply are not having enough hours on fields um, to meet the need, not to mention the fact that we do have some sports that we actually have to rent space on Fruit Street now because other towns won't play us on grass, um, particularly for field hockey. So um, I feel like I'm sort of doing a lot of talking. I want to give you the opportunity to ask questions, but did I leave out anything important? <laughs> so. I'm still heard any questions. Uh, I'm keenly aware of what's going on with this with the project as it liaison from our board to that committee uh, and I get to 90% of the meetings and uh, they've made a lot of progress um, I think there's an opportunity uh, for some sponsorship as well uh, that uh, we can certainly delve into further once we get a bid package back and understand some numbers and talk to others I think you know as the progress of the project moves forward so uh, that's another piece of the puzzle that we can look at that could be significant as well and I'm aware of entities that might be interested in sponsorship so and if I could just add to, to that that is one thing the committee has been doing is we've been looking at the different components that would go with a field complex and what are ones that we can slice out of the ask um, for town meeting because we believe they're things that could either be donor items or sponsorship items. So um, on the if, if any of you could see, have seen the, the summary of the proposal, which I'm sure you see at some point, there's a whole section of things that are kind of at the bottom because they're not being put into that $320 million. We are seeking other opportunities for that. Ms. Wright? So the $3.8 million is what is potentially going to town meeting and then the 1.72 comes from CPC yes. and unless we find sponsorship to cut down that 3.8 yes um, and then what is the long-range view would we soon be looking at proposals to do this for some of the other fields or do we feel that these two fields would would carry us for a while that's a good question. So the reason we have the schematic drawing for two, uh, for two phases it, and the reason that we're starting with the lower fields um, is that about six years ago we resurfaced our track and so there still is usable life in that and, and value to be gained from what we've already expended. So um, in addition to these lower fields providing more flexibility for more hours, we wanted to wait on the football field phase um, until we had used up basically more of the asset that we already bought in terms of resurfacing. So when that project happens, um, it would include expanding the track to eight lanes and it would make the field in the center larger. Right now, um, that field is too small for a regulation women's lacrosse, women's lacrosse <coughs> game and it's tight for some it's others for soccer. Um, so yeah and so the permitting so the schematic design for, for because they're right next to each other and it would involve moving out that retaining wall the schematic design for both projects was done at the um, same time to make sure that it, everything is accounted for likewise the permitting for both projects has been completed through Conservation Commission, so we wouldn't have to go back. So they've looked at all of it, and all of the permitting that would be required for either phase is already 
approved. Um, in addition, we did some work with our, we have a new cross country course, which I think some of you have been on. If you haven't, you really should. Uh, it's really amazing. That was um, done with, by Peter Legoy in 26.2. But um, so we've worked with them to make sure that this doesn't interrupt the flow of the cross country course either. So those things work, work really well together. Um, so the very long winded answer to your question, Claire, is I, I, I don't have it with me. I think that phase two would be closer to 2022. And then other fields that are there no, on Fruit Street? We haven't discussed, we haven't talked about anything else. No, this okay. has been the only discussion and just currently where we're at and projecting a little bit ahead, this would fill a great need that we have. Um, and, and it, to go off of what Jean was saying, the, um, another part of the purpose of doing the lower fields first, because the, the question comes to us all the time is why aren't you doing the you know, field three in the, in the um, track is that in doing fields four and five first, it actually gives us much more um, usage time availability. Two teams can play at once for baseball and softball. Um, so in addition to maximizing the life of the track also, um, it, it would just allow for more usage to do that first. Um, but I, knowing um, what could be done if you know, just one phase is complete, but also two, while also maintaining um, our natural grass surfaces, which are beautiful, mm -hmm. um, beautiful. It's just certainly difficult to maintain that many. And when weather, weather strikes, it, it makes it even more difficult. Um, but we look at it and say that this is an opportunity for teams to be sometimes playing on synthetic turf, sometimes be playing on grass, depending on the availability and the need on, on a given day. Um, so I think it's important to note that um, in, in proposing this project, it's not to eliminate natural grass surface because it's, we have such a gorgeous asset um, in, in terms of our fields and, and acreage of the high school, um, but just to allow those to be properly cared for and to be really, really well maintained. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, again, sort of long-winded answer to your question, but to do this would be, um, I think it would really take care of the need from an athletic standpoint anyway. And the subcommittee actually looked at, we looked at all of the fields and actually had some initial on these fields plus 12 and 13, which are the ones way in the back um, behind Hopkins, um, and, and decided that these options, specifically four and five, would give us the biggest pickup with and, and didn't decide to pursue other options. Okay, so if I'm a taxpayer and I'm looking at this at town meeting or at the ballot box or whatever, I don't have to be looking at it saying to myself, okay, and then another year they're going to be coming for three million more and three million more. I mean, we don't know going down the road, but that that's not really in the immediate forecast that no. if the if the voters approve this expender expenditure, they don't have to be anticipating that we're going to be coming back to the well in short order again and again. For this the project. only other one under discussion at all is this phase two for the football yep. field. Yeah, yep. and that again would be another. Sure. I can't do that for how long? And, and I don't want to hog, but just on that football field one, um, do we know is that in the same price range? Well, that, it's hard to project because it's at least four years out, but yep. um, about. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, just to me. add on to that dialogue a little bit, and I asked the question at the meeting. Um, Field four and five, were they to go forward, the, the way it's designed and the way it would be constructed, it would be independent of whether we ever do field three or right. not. Right. So right. we can do four and five, and that's it. Yeah. Right. I mean, or we can do four and five, and in five years from now, if we want to look at three, we can do that. There's yeah. not, like drainage, everything will be independent. Right. So it won't. <coughs> They've got a lot of their We're not going to tie our hands to have to do something. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. efficiency yeah. and process to have exactly. these to have these d designs done and the permitting done. That's the only reason that these even show up on the same drawing. But they're not interconnected in terms of understood. Doing one does not necessitate doing the other. Correct. We just didn't want if you get to if we get to that point and the the next one is on. And then you find out that we didn't do something in this project that we should have that's now costing money, that we, that's what we're trying to avoid. Well, the other point I would make about field three, which is the varsity football field, and mm -hmm. just the varsity field in general, they call it, that's a stadium, per se. Right. And there's state regulations specific to stadium construction, stadium financing, stadium bathroom, stadium this, stadium that. So it's a different uh, process, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. for the most part. 
and it's a more uh, there's more demands. There'll be more demands on the town for that one field than there are for these two fields here, mm -hmm. which is another reason why they're completely separate and for a future discussion. Mr. Tedstock. <clears throat> so one of the things that we talked about last year was want versus need, and when it came, when that initial number came up, um, I balked at it, and uh, I'm still on the fence. I don't know if I'm pro or, or against this whole process. Um, it's nice that the CPC is going to give 1.72 million. Um, a concern that I would have on this is the new turf fields versus Fruit Street, the relationship you guys have with the Parks and Rec. A concern that I would have, I would be more, more suited to vote for this if the town created a park department. And when I say a park department, it means the school doesn't take care of the grounds anymore. The, the, the DPW doesn't take care of the cemetery. The DPW doesn't take care of the, the common. There's a park department with a guy who lives, eats, and breathes dirt and grass and turf that knows what he's doing, that if a sprinkler system goes out, we don't have to play our football games in Medway, mm -hmm. um, that can, can tell us this is the proper maintenance. And also... A business person that's going to be able to market both of these facilities equally, mm -hmm. so you're not competing against each other. I know it's it's easy to say that we're not that you're not going to be competing against each other, but I think unless you have one pot to pull everything out of, you're just not playing on a level playing field. Yeah, so, so you that's know, pardon the pun. I mean, so obviously a lot of that is outside of the purview of the school committee, whether you create a townwide park department or not. But I will say that that's the spirit in which we engaged in this um, agreement with Parks and Rec. And so, you know, in, in that agreement, you'll see um, a revolving fund specific to that field. So we're not tagging on to the revolving fund that already exists for Fruit Street and diluting revenue that's going into that one, which is mm -hmm. dedicated towards maintenance and um, offsetting the replacement of those fields, we're setting up the same thing for for this field, so that you know this this conversation and, and collaboration has gone incredibly well. I think because of the people who are at the table, but we're trying to bulletproof it for whomever is filling our seats later and wasn't there at the genesis of the project. And so it's set up so that funds raised as a result of rentals of this field will go to offset the costs of maintenance and replacement of this field. So I think that what I would say in response to what you just said is that's probably, because that's already set up at Fruit Street, I don't think that would interfere with what you're talking about and it might be the right way to go even in the context of that kind of, uh, uh, but again, that's, that's in your purview and, and not ours. In terms of the marketing of it, um, you know, we have had those conversations with Parks and Rec and they very gladly are taking that on. That's part of Jay's responsibilities. So really, um, the onus for creating revenue, generating revenue is on Parks and Rec for this. Um, and, you know, and you can see that in, in the agreement as well. But they're very happy to do it. And so that sort of goes to, you know, you'll see in there setting com comparable fees and all of that so that we're not we're very clear that we do not want to compete with or undercut Fruit Street in any way. We just would like to expand um, what's offered. Um, it really should enhance what they're doing there. The, the model that Mr. Ted Stone suggests is in Massachusetts. It's out there. Um, Hanover, Massachusetts, the schools own and control the schools all the land around the schools and all the land with the town are all under one facilities department including mm -hmm. grounds mm -hmm. so there's different there's different models out there for how we can manage things uh, going forward you know we've kicked around a few times over the years the idea of maybe rolling HR departments together mm -hmm. finance departments together uh, I don't think we ever really got down the path with parks and rec and land use and things like that but um, those are great sort of efficiency building models that I'd love to explore. Um, I don't know how that plays out in the next six months as we get ready to go to town meeting with something like this, but 
I think the case study could be right that document in front of you well, for other things to add to it. If I could just add on to that, Brian. So we had a great meeting with Medway, and they do, that is how Medway does it. They have, they have one department that manages all of the um, grounds, including on the school property. And um, we use their um, agreement between the schools and their parks department as <laughs> the foundation for building ours. So, um, so that was a model that we, you know, that we looked at. And again, that's outside of our purview, but this should be, this should work well in that scenario as well. Could I make so, a, sorry, could I just make a comment on, on the, your, your question as well? So at the beginning, you, you referenced last year and, and the one versus need conversation. And so as, as uh, Ms. Birchman mentioned, you know, one of the things we did by, by pulling this is go back and kind of take a, a maybe a more uh, a deeper approach to this. And one of the things that, you know, the, the picture probably doesn't tell is want versus need was a big discussion point for us. So in an original rendering of this, original plan of this, you wouldn't see those baseball diamonds mm -hmm. because we discussed, baseball and softball diamonds, sorry, because we discussed that the coaches said they would probably rather play on regular surface. They'd love this for tryouts, maybe the occasional practice if they could. Then as we were going through last spring, Ms. King pointed out that we are we're having the problem that she said earlier with, with the weather we had, people were having to play five baseball games in five days. And it, correct me if I'm wrong, we were even renting Medway at times, weren't we, to, to play some of our home games. So the decision was made that we, we wanted to, to design in the baseball and softball diamonds here. These may not end up being their main field, but we wanted to maximize the usage of this so that this really was primarily a resource to make sure our athletes had what they needed in terms of facility for the New England weather. So I just, I, I just bring that up as a, you know, we, we heard that last year, that one versus need, and we really wanted to make this, we really wanted to maximize the, the usage of this field. And so you see that in the design. So I know that we're up against the clock, but another, and I know we're not gonna make any decisions today, but one of the things that kind of bothered me last year, and it also was, was said tonight, was towns refused to play us on grass. Field hockey. Or field hockey. So where I come from, that's a forfeit. And we save money on referees. Well, it's non-league games. So we, okay. so, so other Tri-Valley League towns would have to play us. Yeah. Um, but to pick up not, to pick up non-league games is very difficult and um, particularly in the past few years where we had a very competitive field hockey team it's difficult enough to pick up non-league opponents yeah. because when you have a solid record people are hesitant yeah. to play you um, but then when there was grass factored in because field hockey in this region is now played on um, <clears throat> synthetic turf m for the majority um, of places people were just unwilling, they're like, nope, we'd rather play because they're playing, tur the tournament games are on yeah. turf and things like that. So um, that's the only sport that there was uh, any objection to playing, yeah. um, but it did come up and was um, disappointing for, for our team. But thankfully Fruit Street has been good to us, but that is also obviously coming out of the school budget yeah. that we run to Fruit Street. Um, and having to relocate so many games, not only is it then coming out of the school budget, but it also eliminates Fruit Street's ability to, to rent their fields at the higher rate because they're, they've been kind enough to help us. Um, but it's, it's, been, it's been an interesting way to have it play out um, in terms of the timing of it all, um, in terms of people not wanting to play us, the weather issues, people driving on the fields, lots of different things that, that are um, works in progress, but we've had to I would say s steal time from Fruit Street more than we'd like to, and probably more than they'd like to, <laughs> like to share. Though they've been incredibly gracious. Yeah, and that's all I have. And, and mm -hmm. no, no, you, you pick up a second. Please stay where you are. Um, at the, the time being, seven thirty. We have a uh, posted public hearing. The Board of Selectmen will, will um, hold the public hearing uh, on the petition of uh, Verizon New England Incorporated Never Source Energy for one jointly owned pole on the southerly side of. Duffield Road, approximately 349 feet easterly from the center line of Lake Shore Drive. Chair Lantan, a motion to open the public hearing. So moved. Second. Any, any further discussion? Are we done? How do you vote? Aye. 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 Chair and, and will entertain a motion to um, uh, continue. continue the uh, uh, public hearing as, right after we finish uh, with the. So moved. Yeah. But no need for a motion, okay. simply stated. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, so we're open. So now let's we'll continue to yourself. You have any, please. So all I have to say is, <coughs> I, 
I'm not even going to say what I have to say, so that's fine. Okay. <laughs> I could care less if other teams want to play us or not. If, if they don't want to play us on on, uh, on turf, then that's unfortunate. I mean, if they don't want to play us on grass, that's unfortunate. Mrs. Sestari. Um, thanks for that update, Gene. Um, Gene, you were talking about the finances. I know that I got one understanding from what when you said it, and then when you clarified something for Claire, I got a different understanding. So I just want to make sure the $3.8 million is at the starting point, yes. and then 1.7 comes off of yes. that. So then the yeah, okay. ask is roughly $2.1 million. Yes. Oh, okay. thank you. Okay, go ahead. No, that's, that's not what I heard. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, that, that's I why, that's why that I wanted to clarify. 1.72 came from the CPC, and then there was a remaining 3.8 to sorry, be no, financed. 2.8 is the total. Yes. And we take CPC off of that. Yes. Yeah. And I, oh. And I will say that is, you know, that's definitely a question that we will need help with in terms of the Warren article and the ballot question because obviously that is also dependent on the CPC article passing, which well, yeah. always often happens but is not out of the realm of possibility that it wouldn't or it would get pulled out. And so... Um, so that's something that you know we're going to need some help crafting appropriately with the town council. So, so it's um, so so we get to that 2.1 million, and then there's you were mentioning that there are other items that you're looking for, you know, possibly with the sponsorship yes. type model. Um, are those other items things that you would deem you know required for this to be a success? So as a matter of fact, was it yesterday that we had our meeting? If this yep. was Tuesday, yesterday. yesterday. Yeah. Um, Yesterday we had our meeting and we were going through the project list again and pulling out a couple of things that we thought would be good for good opportunities for sponsorship. So things like scoreboards, oh, which obviously you need to have a scoreboard, but there's a perfect room on the bottom of it for adding, you know, one to four sponsors. Um, what else do we the have on system. there? The sound system. Um, we could and so um, some of them made different decisions on different ones, but some of them are sort of like a, be, an ad alternate. There would be a sound system for these fields? Yes. Well, we hope. We hope. It's part of the, we, we had to, yesterday what we did with our time in our meeting is spend time on some of these, you know, what we think is an essential item to have and what we think would be a nice add-on, but if we had to cut it, um, and actually in our next meeting we have to really, we have to create that list. Mm -hmm. um, it was more just discussed yesterday. Um, how does and how does something um, how does something beyond what's there now for functioning fields become required? Let me just jump um, in real quick. To, um, so, Todd, when the, when women's field hockey goes to Fruit Street to play field hockey, they bring a portable sound system down to Fruit Street and use it for that game. Okay, not so, like what we're doing at football games, but they're doing yeah, no, but, something but, now. But when so they're, they're doing so when it they're now, playing, but when they're playing behind the high school right now, are they using a portable system? sound system? using a portable sound system. Okay. Yep. Yep. So, and again, it isn't a requirement, and so that's why it's a great opportunity for someone to sponsor, or it's an ad alternate into the, and it can be, the electricity will be there, so that's not something that has to be mm -hmm. ready at the time the project goes online either. Mr. Kamala, don't go anywhere. I have a question for you next. With the revolving fund. Scoreboard. Um, can revolve can the revolving fund be used to pay for the uh, construction loan? It, it it may depend on how the fund is set up. Um, but I think the the underlying perhaps what I'm reading from the question is is it financially advisable to use a revolving fund to pay for construction? Well, I'm just yeah. I'm just wondering if if. Uh, we're so confident in the ability to get external use and rentals out of these fields and you know right now we're saying that that money will be used toward maintenance and you know possible future resurfacing uh, why don't we why don't we look to paying the loan down instead of putting the burden on the taxpayers it's possible to use the revolving fund to pay for capital projects I think it would be yeah it That's is possible question. so it hasn't been set up yet, so that's a good question. Yeah. I, I, we hadn't thought of that. And then my other, my other, I guess, question or suggestion uh, would be, you know, we just went through an incredibly successful project with the library, mm -hmm. and that involved, 
uh, going out and getting a certain portion of private funds mm -hmm. for that. Uh, I see the library as being something that's much more usable and beneficial to every person in town, uh, young, elderly, and all. And we were asking for private funds for that. Mm -hmm. um, I would, I would personally like to see a good chunk of this be coming from private funds, not in the next phase when we're doing the stadium, but in this phase um, where you know people, people who want to contribute and you know who have athletes or whatever, you know whatever the rationale doesn't matter, um, are paying. I don't know what the percentage is, but I'd like to see a good effort to get private funds before we ask the taxpayers. My last comment is, or question, I guess is um, is it absolutely the intent for this to go on this year's town meeting warrant or are we going to take a look at uh, whatever uh, I'm assuming increase in the town's operational budget is being put in front of the taxpayers before we consider putting an additional cost like this in? Well given all of the deadlines it is on our capital spreadsheet which was due you know already and we haven't voted our budget you guys haven't voted our budget but you know that said obviously the operational and capital budgets are different ultimately you come out of the same pocket mm -hmm. um, and you know I know there was a question actually our appropriations liaison asked yesterday morning at the meeting about um, whether it was possible to do the borrowing this is where I, I get out of my realm, but do the borrowing within the levy limit I, as opposed to putting it on the ballot. It's my personal feeling that a project of this size, you know, I, I realize I'm running a risk, but I, I think it belongs on the ballot. Um, you know, and I don't know the answer to that question, so I would say that right now it's our intent to go forward. We have the CPC funding for 40 something percent of the project. I don't know enough about CPC to know if that's going to stay on the table or if it isn't utilized, if it goes back into their coffers and we would have to go through the process again. Um, you know, in, in general, I've learned through other construction projects that costs only go up. Um, and I, you know, I, I, there has been a tremendous amount of community interest and support in this project. So I guess the answer to your question is, although we don't have full information at this point about all of the budgets right now, it's absolutely your intention to go forward. Um, I, I just actually have a, have a question on the, on the diagram, on the schematic. Are, are there visitor um, bleachers in the portable? Uh, yes. Cause, so because when we get when we grew it wider it, and, and put the eight lane track. Oh, oh, on the, do, do it, and, and you know we run right into two. the right into the retaining wall. On that's phase two, so that's one of the things that Brian was talking about. So. In a stadium project, when you, um, if you have permanent visitor bleachers, it triggers a bathroom requirement. requirement. And so there are a lot of layers in the second phase um, that are not relevant okay. to the first phase. So the answer to your question is in the first phase, we have portable bleachers planned for behind the, um, what do yeah. you call that? The, the backstop. Yep. And, and over there, yeah. but they're they're portable, and there's a gate large enough um, right by there that they can be rolled in for soccer and uh, stuff like that. Excellent. Well, we get all the uh, finance questions. So, any, any, any final questions, Father? Anyone? Mm -hmm. Excellent. I, yes. Sure. <laughs> Go ahead. Just had one kind of clarifying question about how all these field uses are financed. Um, I recall the town bought the Fruit Street land a number of years ago at quite a price. And I don't know quite how the development of all those fields was funded. I'm assuming a lot of that was funded by the townspeople as well. CPC. And CPC. CPC and, and which is soccer. the townspeople. Which is the townspeople. And then I, this is really, then I heard you say that when we were not able to use our school fields because of the weather conditions, we had to use school budget money to rent our own Fruit Street fields. So again, our town's taxpayers' money was being paid to rent our own fields that were funded 
by the townspeople. Um, I, I, I'm a little surprised to hear that. I, I don't know what the rental arrangements are. There seems to be something not quite right the in that, that we're, we're, set we're up. paying to rent our own fields the operating that we agreement, paid for. Yeah, the operating agreement was set up and agreed to at town meeting at that time that soccer would be a key driver behind the Fruit Street Fields development. Soccer put in a chunk of money. Uh, I think it was a half million dollars, mm -hmm. if, I remember, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And soccer, uh, with Parks and Rec, would be the managing authority that would then lease out the fields <coughs> to various entities. And the lease rates were set, and the lease rates for town facility or town groups was one, schools I think was another, and outside groups was a third. So that was all sorted out as part of the process. Okay, so but it is a little odd that we rent so to ourselves. Presumably, maybe we got a better rate than a neighboring town. That's correct. But mm -hmm. nonetheless, we are paying, and, and our money is going into what? To the Hoppington Youth Soccer Fund, which pays for the continued maintenance. Which maintains of those fields. the fields, yeah. Just that that revolves. And, and, and at the end of the, the, end of the, well, the, end the, end of the 10 years, that fund is supposed to have right. enough money to resurface the fields. Okay. If I could just give you an example yeah. from our conversation with Medway, <clears throat> with what they found, so they do the same thing, and, and really every town does, that there is an in town usage fee mm -hmm. um, for the fields, and then obviously much higher out of town usage fee. Okay. Um, so what we our intention is to just charge the same rates that are already being charged at Parks and Rec for the town um, for the town groups. But the lesson that we learned from Medway is that they actually charge such a reduced rate for the town fields that people just reserve them and don't use them, mm -hmm. forfeiting the very small amount of money. Mm -hmm. And then basically they leave a lot of revenue on the table mm -hmm. because they Perfect. could they're just being unused when they could be rented at the higher outside rate. So, I mean, that was the good cautionary tale, and I think for us, we're fortunate that Fruit Street really has already set that precedent and set those rates with our um, town groups, and so it's something that they're already used to and expecting. I understand, like, sort of feel, so philosophically, it yeah. doesn't feel right, but it's all about contributing to the maintenance and offsetting the replacement of the fields because yeah. otherwise that entire expense is borne by the town. I think that scenario that you were explaining as far as making reservations and then backing off, that was occurring at Fruit Street for the first year or two as well. It might have um, been, yeah, yeah. I mean, I know and, they've... But, but before, I guess, before you just commit to the same rates and rate structure, I guess I would want to take a look at, at their fund and make sure that it's on track to actually be able to do the full uh, Resurfacing at the end of the ten years, yeah. Because if they're coming up short, <coughs> you know, some adjustment needs to be made. And and you'll see in that agreement at the beginning of every season, there's a meeting of this you know oversight committee to make sure that there is appropriate rate setting and scheduling and you know making a decision about whether we are going to or not going to plow and cost sharing between two. So um, so that gets revisited multiple times in the year. Um, yeah, and I, and I guess the only other factor would be if, if we do find that it's absolutely okay to use that fund to pay for the loan yeah, itself, I think a then, great suggestion. then you need to factor that into the, into the rates, too. Yeah, I had not thought of that. It's a good suggestion. Well, thank you for taking time to give that explanation because if it's not clear to me. I'm sure there are people at home, listening at home, that have these kind of questions, so it, it's worth explaining to the larger audience yeah, that's listening. No, thank you. Thank you for having us. Voters need to understand it. Have the opportunity. So thank you. For it. And thank you for <laughs> coming. Dave, thanks for missing your game for us. Oh, so that's okay. okay. I'll get some off of you. <laughs> thank you so thank much. You. Thanks for having us. Merry Christmas. Okay. All right, next up, let's get back to the uh, public hearing. Defo okay. Road Utility <coughs> Pole, Verizon and Eversource. <coughs> Eversource, come on down. Of Verizon. Welcome. Good evening, how are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, my name is Tom Blickars. I work for UC Synergetic. Uh, we are contractors for Verizon. So I'm here on behalf of Verizon to petition for this uh, full location. Uh, in town, Verizon sets the poles and takes the old poles down. Uh, we received a request from Eversource to place this pole on uh, 
it's a Duffield? Uh, Duffield. Duffield, Duffield Street, uh, Duffield pole two and a half. And what we got from them was that they are going to upgrade their wires, and so they need that extra pole in between pole two and pole three. So this is an intermediate pole that they need for their wires. Verizon will just simply attach whatever they have out there to the new pole. But this is being done at the request of Eversource to us, and we place the poles at Hopkinton. So we are going to comply with that request. Excellent. Thank you very much. Mr. Kamala, I always like to ask you to start because one of the issues that we've been having with poles in town, and I don't know whether it's Verizon or Eversource who you've been dealing with, have they been dealing with you on the up and up? You know, are we getting, are we getting um, uh, action on the double poles, and et cetera, et cetera? <coughs> Yeah, uh, through the chair. Um, I think the a good starting point will be way back uh, <coughs> late summer in August, where the board expressed its concern regarding the progress or lack of progress uh, made by the utility companies in removing double poles in town. Mm -hmm. um, since that meeting, I can report that the following have been accomplished. One, the town now has access to uh, NJUS, NJU, NJUS. Uh, this is uh, a database that was set up to allow for a collaborative e effort between utility companies and towns, uh, giving us insight as to the progress that is made on each poll. Remember, from our prior discussions, there are different utilities that are placed on each pole. So through this database, we're able to actually track the progress and identify who is responsible for moving the next line. So we now have access to that, to that database. Secondly, we've also in town appointed a, a gatekeeper. Uh, our town engineer has access to the database and uh, does receive uh, live information uh, on time regarding what activities have been performed and who might be next in moving the next utility. And then thirdly, through that process, we've also been able to track how many poles have actually been removed. Uh, you'll recall that, that back in August, we had Verizon partnering with Eversource and immediately removed nine or 10 double poles. Since then, Verizon has removed its utility lines on 15 other poles in town. We are now waiting for the next responsible party to act on those poles. So on the ground, there has been <coughs> some progress. And then tied to this is the whole effort towards building a better relationship with Eversource. Case in point, most recently, we needed work to be done to allow for the completion of the DPW project. Yes, there were communication snafus here and there. However, eventually, yes, they did provide the appropriately sized uh, generator for, for, the, for, the, for the facility, and we were able to um, secure the required permits from our inspections department. So overall, communication <coughs> has improved. We now have visibility to the database. Uh, tracking who's doing what uh, and also uh, we are looking at uh, many other opportunities where we can improve the communication relative to service delivery what, what I'm what I what I what I'm looking for at least in this particular application is whether there's an immediate need to provide service to a resident uh, and, and if that's the case, that's what we're hearing, then this is a priority need that the, the board should consider moving forward. Brendan. Uh, how many double poles did we have in town? Um, when we met in August, we were at 51. Uh, there was action taken that brought the number down to at least, uh, at least 38. And then from that, point on, there's been action on at least 30 poles. 30? 30, yes, action. But not that's total action. removal. So action, action could be, yes, that's, yes. that's a double pole. Yeah. I, this is crap. 
Yeah. You guys, th these guys can come up before us all the time, yeah. as often as you want. <clears throat> Bottom line is, I think we spoke as a group and we said that we want we want these double poles taken care of. Within a week, they did nine. Mm -hmm. In August, yeah. we're three months later. They've done fifteen. Mm -hmm. It's garbage. It's all sizzle. No steak. I'm out. This is this is them dragging their feet again and playing Eversource versus Verizon versus whomever. It's garbage. So tell your company or whoever that, <coughs> tell them it's me, that I, uh, tell them to fix the, f the poles. I almost said something I shouldn't have. Tell them to fix the poles. Just a couple of things you're not supposed no, to say. No, no. Um, it's, uh, it's frustrating because, uh, you know, the, the company's enormous. Both of those companies are enormous, and they can't send 10 crews out there to fix five and a half poles in, in I, three months? I can't speak to double poles. I know. I'm not here to talk about double poles. Okay. Is this, uh, am I going to get this lo uh, location or not, really? We'll discuss well, for, for me, we'll no. You know at the end of the <clears throat> well, I'm sure. For me, no, because you're, you said that you're representing. I am. You're a subcontractor. I'm not here to talk about double poles. I, okay. I have no, no database in front of me. I have okay. no information. I'm not authorized to talk about double poles. You do this every time I come here. Okay. This is the only town that uh, beats up on me and embarrasses me uh, for double poles. There's double poles in every town. Well, there shouldn't be. And I'm sorry that you feel embarrassed, but if you continue to come before us knowing that the there's double poles, poles here, I'm well, not prepared to do that. If, okay. Why don't you get <coughs> so someone here who can talk to you about double poles? We've we've tried. We've had we've we've had this discussion. We've put it out. Norman spoke to them. They're not getting it done. So my point of view, and I'm not speaking for the board. My, no, no, no. Don't interrupt me. My point of view is that I'm not going to say yes to anything that this company does until they fix the double poles. Okay. So they can send you. They can send Vanna White. They can send whoever they want up here before us. I'm going to say no. So my answer is no. I'm done. Bring it before the board. <coughs> Todd. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Kamalo, uh, what about Eversource? Uh, are we getting what we need from Eversource? So Eversource is really making this request through Verizon. Eversource is the one that, that needs something done here. So in everything we have going with Eversource, which is, you know, quite a bit, mm -hmm. are, we getting, are we getting what we want, what we need? No tour of the time. We're getting information when we request information <coughs> from them? We, we are getting some information, uh, and it's taking longer to get some of the information that we need. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I'm the one that about two years ago, you know, started the big march on, you know, double poles and this and that. I think that, you know, First of all, it does get frustrating, but I think since August, there's been some progress made. You know, could it be faster? Maybe it could be, you know, but we've made quite a bit of progress. Uh, I see a number of polls that new polls have been put in. The old ones are still there. And I understand now you gotta wait for different companies to move wires and this and that. You know, that's, that's all good. And, you know, as long as we're making forward progress, um, you know, not only when, not only when people need something, then I'm good with that. Um, but uh, again, <coughs> this is coming back to this is this is a request that Eversource needs, and there are times when we need something from Eversource and we're not getting it. And for that reason, I'm inclined to vote no to this, unless somebody tells me that this is some absolute safety issue. Um, the fact that it's been this way for, you know more than a couple months, I would think probably years, if not decades, um, tells me that this isn't some critical safety issue. Um, so again, unless somebody tells me it is, then you know, I'm not, I'm not going to vote to approve this either. Um, well, I had just a, more, a couple more sort of mundane questions for um, Mr. Blickers. There, we have a photograph here with a stake of where the pole was going to go um, beside this property. And I noticed at the very other side of a fairly small amount of frontage, there is another pole. Um, can you tell me, is, is that your pole as well, or is that pole being removed, or are they going to have these two poles 
within a couple feet of each other on their same frontage. Do you uh, the other pole is not going to be removed as far as I know. Uh huh. And it's more than a couple of feet. It's probably more like 30 or 40 feet between those two poles. I was out there this afternoon for the first time to take a look at it. The stake is missing, I think it's because of the snow. Mm. It's right there on the corner, and I think someone plowed it over. Mm -hmm. So the stake is not there. So, you know, I'm not a power engineer. I don't know why Eversource needs a pole so close yeah. to the one before it. Um, I do know this, that the home that you're looking at there seems to be fed by a mid-span secondary wire. There's a transformer on that pole that you see. Uh -huh. Uh, there's also a steep hill beyond that stake. So it's got to be some kind of a clearance issue or a service issue as they go to upgrade the wires. The, there's a single phase primary way on the top. Maybe they're putting three phase. I don't know. But it, I was hoping there would be somebody here from Eversource, but uh, apparently there is not. Mm -hmm. So I can't speak for them. I can't. I, I, I don't know the, the, uh, the finite detail of why they need that extra pole. There wasn't yeah. any information in the package I received to come here this evening. So, yeah. on why they ever source, you know, specifically needs that. Mm. So, because you know, you know they I have I, an I, obligation I, to be here too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> no, definitely. I mean, this being a public hearing, I, I'm assuming that all the abutters and that homeowner was notified, and I, I didn't see any response from that homeowner. I'm assuming they know about it. Um, you know, I don't know how they make these decisions as to where the poles go. It just seems it's awfully close on that person's property to have two poles. Um, you know, and, and, and I had one, uh, just one other question mm -hmm. on the, um, on the request letter from Verizon, and it's asking specifically, can't find it right now, asking specifically for the pole location, but then there's always this catchphrase at the end that says something about also uh, laying of laterals and, um, <coughs> oh, what is it? Other uh, underground laterals, uh, cables and wires in the public way. I, I didn't see any response from our DPW about that. Sometimes that's something they'd notice. Were there any plans in conjunction with this to be doing anything underground no, in the no, public no, no. way, digging up the pavement? There is nothing underground the proposed there. Some of these statements are like motherhood type statements. For instance, if we, any utility places the new pole, they automatically get the okay for the an anchor in case that pole is on a corner and we need mm -hmm. to support that pole. Mm -hmm. No sense placing the pole if we can't support it. So as long as that anchor goes in the public way, with the pole approval, we also get the approval automatically for the anchor. Mm -hmm. So um, there is no underground being yeah. proposed out yeah. there. Certainly not by Verizon. I just remember asking this question another time, and that seemed to be standard language, and I just didn't like the idea that we were being asked to sign off a blanket statement about digging up the public way if that wasn't that wasn't the request, because sometimes that's that's an issue on our pavement management. If it's just been resurfaced, and then they, they dig it up. So, um, okay, well, I'm... I'm sorry. Um, so we have covered this ground before, and, and I, I, I can appreciate your frustration. Uh, my sense is the board's position really hasn't changed. Mine has not. Uh, I agree with you. Eversource should be here. And um, I don't see anything in the packet that would suggest this is a safety concern. I think this is a uh, probably a better way of going and a better install. I mean, I live around electricity and poles in the whole electrical world, so I'm not going to engineer this thing. Uh, but my sense is if we pass right now, uh, all will be well tomorrow. So I'm not inclined to support it. But I don't have any questions for the, for the petitioner. Um, I feel bad that he keeps coming into this situation, but it's not his issue, it's his company's issue. Um, oh, absolutely. But if, you know, just in, in terms of just efficiency here tonight, you know, We've heard from the petitioner, we've heard from us. I think we should close the public hearing or suggest we close the public hearing unless we have members of the public here. I guess we should ask that and then let's get on with figuring this out. Yep. Okay, and members of the public do but wish to speak on the uh, on the utility pole at uh, uh, Lakeshore Drive. Duffield Road. Duffield Road. Duffield Road. Oh, yeah, Paul. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, <coughs> hearing none. Uh, the board, the chair, it, uh, retain a motion to uh, close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. How do you vote? Aye. 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 Okay, public hearing is closed. Okay, let's uh, begin debate. I. Uh, I don't feel the need to debate this issue. I think we've made our point very clear in recent months, specific to our concerns with these poll owners, whether it be Verizon, Eversource, or a combination of the two. And until, you know, while there was some progress when we raised a little heck a few months ago, uh, but it seems like it's slowing now. So um, I would <coughs> argue that we not support this poll location uh, with all due respect to the petitioner himself, the individual. Um, and send the message back to our Eversource and Verizon that we are not satisfied in Hopkinton. And I don't really, um, while I understand that other towns put up with double polls, I don't <coughs> necessarily mean that's why we should put up with double polls. So I don't really agree with that argument that those companies present to us that there's other towns with double polls. That's nice. We don't want them in Hopkinton, and we sure as heck don't want 50 of them or 38 of them, whatever's left. If there's one or two every now and then because that's the way things happen, we get it. But this is a problem that's a convenience of theirs <coughs> and inconvenience of ours, and that's how I feel. Now, for, for me, it's um, I, I really do feel as though they, they, they've made some progress. Um, you know, before, uh, before this, the uh, August meeting, we, we had nothing. Now, now, that, now, at least, at least, uh, town hall has the ability, and, and uh, Dave Del Torrio have the ability to see who's who's slacking. I, now, I, I feel badly because uh, for for the gentleman that's here because Eversource didn't show up. That's uh, th you know, that would be um, why I would tend not to uh, um, vote for it because they're the, they're actually the petitioner. He comes in front of us every time. We beat him up every single time. He comes, a poor guy. And has not, has really nothing to do with. It. He's a contractor. Um, well, I live here in town. I'm a taxpayer here in Hopkinton too. So, <laughs> oh, do, give him the darn poll. I don't have, a, <laughs> I don't have a, a, a little clout, but uh, well, yeah. And I, I would just say that um, first of all, it's. I know I can only really speak for myself, but I think I speak for the others on the board. It's never our intention to embarrass you, no. and if that's how it comes off, then that's. We need to we need to come up with a different approach, mm -hmm. uh, at least in terms of what we say. Um, but this is this we found to be our only opportunity when these requests come through to actually try to get anybody's attention. Mm -hmm. If it's not something that uh, you know that that one of these large utilities absolutely needs, uh, or you know if it's not if it's not something that they need and we can say no to, then they don't really listen to our requests at all. Mm -hmm. How much they listen to them now, I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm surprised to hear the gentleman talk about the database that you can access with mm -hmm. a login and password and, and get into our systems, get into Verizon systems. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. So that's progress. I, it, think, it's I think that's progress. a lot better than it was a year ago when I was here. There's, there's no question that it's better than it was a year ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, right now, though, in looking at this specific request, while it's coming through Verizon, because Verizon is managing the polls, mm -hmm. the request is really from Eversource. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're seeing uh, the relationship with Eversource really hasn't improved for us. Mm -hmm. So that's where, we're, that's where we're speaking to tonight, right. at least for me. I know that there's still some talk about the split polls and things like that, too. Um, again, you know. We were at 51. We're probably in the 20s right now. As long as we're making forward progress, yeah. I'm good with that. I don't, I don't ever expect it to get down to zero, to be honest. Um, but when we're talking about Eversource, and we have a lot of different things going on with Eversource, <coughs> um, you know, that's that's where we need to get some attention. So. Understood. And we always understand that you or whoever's sitting in that chair is just a representative of the company and okay. not the person with all the answers and not the person saying no to this, that, and the other. I understand. Uh, so. That's good. Thank you. Well, I'm also thinking that it's entirely possible that the late pattern of Eversource not coming and simply sending the Verizon rep may be part of a strategy that we're more likely to give the approval if Eversource isn't <laughs> here. Uh, <laughs> and there's a very good reason why, even though they should be here, they're not, because... Uh, 
you know, there's there's a sympathy factor, and I think we all feel that, you know, Mr. Blicker's just been beat up on lately, but uh, that may be part of a strategy. And <clears throat> I apologize because it's not my goal to embarrass you. My frustration is Eversource. It's not you. It's Eversource, and it's everything that has to do with Eversource. It has nothing to no do with problem. you. So if I embarrassed you from the bottom of my heart, I apologize. I didn't mean no to embarrass you. No problem at all. <clears throat> Yeah, understood. I'm a Verizon retiree. I spent my career with Verizon engineering manager. So I know, I know the frustration with double poles. They're, they're, they're a bugaboo. They're hard to do oftentimes. Mm -hmm. uh, they take time and there's, a, there's, whole not, there's not a whole lot of productivity credits or nuggets getting given or taken by taking cables off an old pole, putting on a new pole. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, they like all the new stuff. It's hard going back to fix the yeah. old. Yeah, yeah, they're not making any extra money by exactly. changing poles. <laughs> okay, um, Mr. Kamala, should uh, well, the, I, I guess the, the chair will request a motion to grant permission to erect and maintain the pole wires, cables, together with anchors, guys, and other sustaining protecting fixtures on Duffield Road, substantially as shown in the submitted plan. Hearing no motion, um, I guess it's. Uh, I guess this is tabled for now. Okay. So what? I'll just go back and tell my uh, contacts in Verizon that this was tabled. It wasn't a no or or, or what. Well, we didn't have a. It's a the board was not inclined to make a motion, motion to approve. <coughs> yeah. Okay. I figured that was the cleanest way of doing it, rather than just giving a complete no. We just didn't. We. Okay. Well then, you know, maybe you know Al Bissett, who was our right-of-way manager, our Verizon's right-of-way manager. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe not. So this will go back to Al. Al has channels, and he will get in contact with uh, EverSource, probably yeah, you I folks. I was going to say, it's really, a, it's a matter of EverSource reaching out. Exactly. All right. All right. Thanks very much for coming. Thank, Thank you. you for Thank you for your patience. Yeah. And, and for Merry the time. Christmas. Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Good night, Thank all. Good night. night. Okay. Well, do you want to keep with the uh, regular agenda? Do we have enough to go with the regular agenda? Do you want to jump to uh, annual town meeting? Yes, we realizing that uh, we have re representatives from the school committee. Do you want to jump into the FY19 budget update? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Town manager report FY19 budget update. We're, we're just Please feel free. Go feel free. Come on up. <laughs> Yeah, we're just uh, we're just trying to thank you for for indulging us and staying. Don't take so a we, set. <laughs> okay. No, you guys are supposed to switch chairs. We're just keeping <laughs> <so, laughs> Mr. Chair, to be clear, we're in item ten yeah. at yes. the moment, correct? Uh, no, item eleven, town managers report the FY nineteen budget update. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm going by the yeah, yeah, okay. Sorry. Thank you. My, I'm sorry. My draft copy. Yes. Um, let, let me let me break this up into perhaps three components. Uh, first off, talk about the process, and then second part, talk about the the numbers that we are looking at now. Uh, and, and for all intent and purpose, these are projected numbers. Um, ev everybody, both on the town side and the school side, was still going through our budgets and. Um, we felt that it was important that we bring this to the board's attention. And then the third component would be then therefore a discussion with the board on some of the key questions from, from the presentation. Uh, in, in terms of process, uh, a couple of things. On the town side, we are continuing our conversations with the individual departments, uh, reviewing the individual <coughs> departmental budgets. Um, and it's, it's pretty clear, uh, I think, from the larger departments uh, that given their needs, um, they will not be able to uh, meet the guideline that was set uh, for the town side, which I believe was 2% increase overall. On the school side, I also believe that um, the school committee 
the school superintendent and the department heads have now gone through their individual departments and it is projected also uh, that the school <coughs> request will uh, exceed the guideline that the board uh, outlined in the budget message. And um, be that as it may, I should mention that there are some departments that have met the guideline, but considering the, <coughs> the departments that have said they would not meet the guideline and the numbers that they are looking at overall, we will far exceed the projected 3% increase overall. Um, so that's the first piece. In terms of specifics, uh, on, the two, on the school side, I think it's projected that the, the budget increase will be around 7%. Um, on the town side, we're looking at the numbers and the increase is going to be greater than 3.5%. And then in, in terms of where, yes, in terms of where we are um, on the projections that were made relative to expenses, uh, I think the, the numbers are what I've just shared with you. And then on the revenue side, uh, there have been uh, some, some changes that I, 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 I need to share with the board. Free cash, we don't have a specific number yet. We're finalizing our free cash certification, and we should have a number um, perhaps by the end of this week, tentatively. Um, I'm not suggesting that that number would have been certified by the state, but it's a number that we will then present to the state. We also are looking at our new growth number. As you know, um, most recently when the board did the tax recap, uh, we did uh, specify uh, that in FY18, our new growth is going to be more than 2.2 2 million. However, what I want to share with the board tonight is that for our planning purposes, we're still using 1.8 million for new growth. Uh, and the reason being, yes, last year was a great year in terms of new growth because we had a large number of, uh, um, of, of apartments coming in through the mews. Uh, the process at Legacy Farms North is much slower. Uh, however, this is a number that we're continuing to look at. Uh, it may change going forward. Uh, and then also on what we, we, what we learned uh, through the uh, FY18 <coughs> tax rate certification process or setting process uh, was that the, the local revenues number was down uh, from 5.1 that we had estimated. Uh, it came in at 4.5 million. And so that's also another number on the revenue side that has gone down. Um, so we have a situation here where clearly the needs are growing and the revenue part is dwindling. Uh, however, uh, again, as we always say, uh, this we're in November. <laughs> uh, sorry, we're in December now, and, and we still have a long way to go. Uh, we're hoping that uh, the revenue side may, con may, may improve. Uh, however, and the needs, <coughs> the needs, I think, uh, are the issue that the, the board will need to discuss with the different entities in town. Therefore, the question I have for the board is, does the board have any input regarding the fact that the needs that are showing up now, that are projected, far exceed the guidelines that the board set in the budget policy? And then secondly, uh, as the board gets ready to uh, begin the budget process, uh, in terms of your review of the budget, uh, is there any specific information that you'd like us to present that will allow you to better review and evaluate the budgets that are coming in. As I have said, these budgets will exceed the budget message that the board put out. So right now, if we blend the 7% increase for the schools, 3.5% increase for the town, we're looking at roughly a 5.25% increase? Net of new growth, perhaps, but overall it's more than. No, than, how would it be yeah. more? And how would it if be it's more? It's 50-50. Yeah. If it's seven and three and a half, let's say it's seven and four yeah. to keep it simple. Yeah, yeah. So so that'd so be five and a half. Five and a half. Yeah. And new growth is what? 
I, I can remember the the the, the three percent that we projected initially was net of new growth. Okay. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, but you're 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 blending revenue and you're blending tax impact right now. I'm not talking. We're not talking tax impact. We're talking. We're talking just pure cost side operational right. cost numbers. Yeah. If they're Correct. at seven and they're at seven and we're at four, just for conversation's sake, yeah. it's five and a half. Right. So now let's slide to the revenue side. So five and a half is the increase in cost side. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hold that number. Yeah. Let's slide to the revenue side and jump in when I go off track here. On the revenue side, what's new growth projected to be? One percentage point, wise. One point eight. One point eight million. One point eight million is just two percent. Okay, so now we're down to three and a half. Okay, what other revenue impacts plus or minus do we have? Local, local revenue, revenue is down. going down. Local revenue went down what from what to what? Six hundred thousand, did you say? No, uh, four point yes. We 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 had projected five point one million. Yeah. Went out down to four point five million. Okay, that's six hundred G so that's one and a half points. So now we're at three and a half, we're back to five percent. Um, well, I think well, that's, six hundred less is, than one. That's less. It's than less. Than, oh, I'm sorry. I'm. I'm yeah, stuck it's on more like half three quarters. Yeah, three quarters. Three quarters. So it's three quarters. So we're at three and a half or four, four and a quarter. Four and a quarter. Four and a quarter. Anything else on macro scale here? Uh, debt service is up from ten point two million to eleven point five million. But that's in the operational budget already, isn't it? We're talking about projections. No projection. That's not in the three and a half you're talking for town side? It the, is. Okay. Yeah, okay. So I've already figured that in. Let's go there. Count that one. What else? Yeah. I don't mean to brush you off. I'm just yeah. trying to no, get through yeah, the yeah. Yeah. So, so in my mind, and I think in Mr. Sestari's mind, the taxpayers right now are looking at a 5% increase no, no, for four, FY. Four, four, four and a quarter. Four and a quarter. Yeah. In fact, three, oh, sorry, four yeah. and a quarter yeah. tax increase for FY19 if everything stays the same today. Mm -hmm. Now that four and a quarter is inside the excess levy. So while it's over two and a half, it does not require an override. That's correct. Um, but it's higher than two and a half, which is ultimately the goal here. Well, well this was always the year we expected. You know, when we looked at all the projections for the past three or four years, this was the, this was the one that was going to This was the year where it was going up. So yes. I guess I'll, I'll give you the exact number if you give me a second. I, I have a, a formula that I can use right away. Does my math make sense? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Does everybody yeah. does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> so we'll be chewing about what what are we looking at? One point seven five. So we'll be looking at taking about a million and a half from the excess levy capacity. Uh, what is it? If four and a quarter? Two yeah. and a half? No, because the excess levy's going to go up this year, year too. It's going up this year again, too. You know what I mean? Because that excess levy that you don't take grows. Mm -hmm. So, um, I guess in pure dollars, it would be, what is it? Four and a quarter? Yeah. So that's one and a so half. We're gonna that's be, we're going to be chewing about 1.75%. Yeah, that's correct. That. So it's a little over a million and a half. Yeah, about a million six. Yeah. So what that means is years ago and two years ago, when we did tax to the max and we then put the underrides through and we set this excess levy up, mm -hmm. we left that cash in the pockets of the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. Right? And we didn't we didn't collect tax money that we could have collected by law and per our budget, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What we're looking at right now is going and collecting some of that money that we left in the taxpayers' pockets the last several years mm -hmm. to, keep, to maintain level services plus the growth of the new you know, community members, which is huge uh, in some of these budgets. Um, I mean, that's kind of what it boils down to. And then with the schools, there's a lot of unfunded mandates, too. Well, so, I, that, that I mean, let's... Yeah. Here's the number. The tax impact net of new growth will be 5.13 percent. 5.13. Yes. What do we come up with for a quarter? Yeah. Why are we off? Well, because we. 
we're using rough numbers. I have more specific numbers in here. I'm looking directly at the budget model, and if I adjust the school increase to 7%, it goes up to 7.39%, and I adjust the... So now so we're looking, at going, seven, seven we're seven now we're looking at going a little over 2 million into excess <coughs> levy capacity. Yeah. All right. And what, what is our excess levy capacity right now? It was right around just over 2 million. Okay, so we're going to wipe that out. So what do you have in there for stabilization? I, I don't have the specific number on that, but these are, these are combined numbers. Combined with? These are global numbers. Um, 300,000 estimated. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's a so half point. Maybe. You know, I'm not, I'm not yeah. trying to ring any alarm bell. This is a, just a question. Um, if this went through like this, and then next year we have a similar budget, um, we're probably looking at requiring an override, or no? Most likely. Okay. But Mr. Kamalo, is this, if we're going by the sheet that I've got, is this, if we're, we're going up from three point, I mean 380,000 going into OPEB to uh, almost 1.1? It, that's on the expense side. Okay. Yeah. I don't follow you. That's no, that's the contribution to OPEB is how much? Well, this is there's some of the rough numbers that I, that, 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 that I, I was I'm going by. The OPEB number is the last one on the, the second grouping. Second group. Because you know, again, that's what we—that's what we did a couple of years ago. Was you know, it's if you don't have money to go into into so, savings. So you know, yeah, the message we, we created the budget message. Everybody agreed on the budget message back in October. What do we have from the town side, and what do we have from the school side that was <coughs> unexpected? Um, that's that's driving us so far out of whack from the numbers that we thought we could. I, I believe what I'm what I'm hearing on both side, on both the town and I'll let the school um, uh, share their comments. On the town side is the impact of the town growth on public safety, and we also have new buildings that are coming online. We have a building that we a facility that the town may be assuming responsibility for coming next year, center school, uh, and. Basically, it's it's the new growth and the new facilities that are coming <coughs> now. So can I not speak on behalf of the schools, but let me just give you my interpretation of where we are with the schools since I've been at all these budget meetings as their liaison, and then we can go to them. because so I think this will help kind of keep the conversation reasonably organized. Uh, the schools, if it's seven, in, in simple sort of macro terms, you've got a 3% contractual obligation baked into that, okay, so there's three of it. You've got basically 2% growth year over year in students, in all the costs associated with that, just the new people coming to town. There's transportation in there is uh, just under 1% of their budget now. I'm not talking about our collective budget, I'm talking about their budget. And uh, their special education requirements is a 2% increase in their budget year over year, it's a $900,000 increase. So those numbers right there add up to 8%. Yes, sir. And I'm not sure what you do with some of those numbers. I mean, that's not our job, it's their job, but that's those are the facts as so I the, see So the increases on the special education, that stuff, I know we've gone through this before, that's unpredictable. You never know what it's gonna be from one year to the next, correct? Yeah, and, and you know, <laughs> I think what's driving our budget increases I could just say ditto to what Norman just said, is the it, you know, huge increase in growth and the diversity of our population, um, as well as bringing a new building online and you know, facilities um, needs. So it happens to also be the year that we're going out for, that we have to renew our bus contract. So based on our last estimate, we're carrying a $300,000 $300, estimated, estimated increase for that. Um, what percentage increase is that? So that combined with the increased utilities 
switching from the center school to the marathon school, which although it's a LEED certified school is 30,000 square feet larger mm -hmm. than the center school, so there's an increase in utilities. So those two combined is about 1% about of our budget. The special education costs um, combined combined effect of outplaced students students who are already outplaced moving into Hopkinton so previously in a placement but moving into Hopkinton so then we inherit that in addition to a 10% decrease in our circuit breaker reimbursement from the state mm -hmm. over the last two years um, so we are projecting so it's it's gone from maybe it's eight percent it's gone from 73 percent reimbursement two years ago down to 65 percent now mm -hmm. so we're projecting 65 percent um, to be safe um, and then the rest of it you know as as Brian said we are in order to keep class sizes consistent with where they are now <coughs> Although we're decreasing at some schools and adding at other schools, overall we're netting an addition of 10 teachers or eight teachers. Um, so there's, you know, that's how you get to where we are. So it's almost all of it is really uh, an addition of eight teachers. Well, some of it, some of some it's of net it. because so the marathon school will have more classrooms than center school. So we know we've been, you know, Lauren's been fitting them in where they can, but we can't add teachers to center school because we don't have classrooms for them. So we have more classrooms at Marathon School, so we'll be adding more teachers. There is a <coughs> corresponding offset in, in support staffs that are necessary for the, um, because you're gonna have lower class sizes. But yeah, so what's that come out to at, at Marathon School? Well, as in terms size. of headcount yeah. overall for the building, it's a net of one, one unless that doesn't include the, the additional custodians. What's the average right. classroom size though? Um, so for kindergarten and first grade, the average class size, I don't have it directly in front of me, but I think we're starting at 17 for kindergarten and 20 for first grade in anticipation of what we have experienced year over year, which is far exceeding our NESDAQ projections. I believe we had 50 additional kindergartners beyond what we expect, excuse me, first graders beyond what we expected this year. And as John said, there's a little bit of sticker shock because had we had classroom space at center school we would have incrementally been adding teachers over the last several budgets because right now we have class sizes 24 25 children in each classroom um, but we haven't had the physical space mm -hmm. available to do that so yeah but that and but that's uh, that's <coughs> on your side library on our side exactly. that's all stuff that's all stuff we had visibility into in October um, I understand that the SPED is stuff that you didn't. Um, so I guess I know that you guys have been having some conversations about this, and I haven't been a part of those, and I haven't really heard how they're, you know, progressing or not progressing. But on that on that SPED piece, um, you know, and you know all these different components that you never know what it's going to be from one year to another, but it is mandated, and. I don't think anybody wants to, you know, try to deny, even if we could, you mm -hmm. know, kids their proper education. Um, but what I'm wondering is, um, you know, I look at things like that, uh, and pardon me for bringing it down to this level, but I compare it on our side to snow and ice. We never know what snow and ice is going to be each year. Right. Is there any way of having an account where it's not adding to the operational budget um, so that Sure, this year, you know, maybe there's, I don't know what the number is, so I'm just gonna throw a number out. Maybe there's 30 kids that are being addressed, uh, you know, and you need, you know, a total of $3 million. Um, next year, it might be $5 million, or it might be one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. But I hate to see that number adding on to the operational budget each year, where, you know, now it's okay, let's get another two and a half, and I'm not saying you're saying this, but. Yeah. You know, it's just as, okay, we can get another 2.5% or 5% on top of that operational budget. Yeah, so in part what you're talking about is exactly what we've been experiencing. So Circuit Breaker is that revolving fund. And so um, Circuit Breaker, and I'm going to look to John to help me with this because he's our math person, but essentially we, we bill for, so for special education costs that exceed $43,000 $43, per student, we get reimbursed 
up to X percent from the state. And so that's what I was referring to has gone down from 73 percent to 65 percent. So first A, you have to hit that threshold. We have had more kids move in than anticipated. So that's, we're <coughs> paying up to the threshold for more kids. In addition, we have, you know, the, the particular costs are more expensive. In addition, the reimbursement rate has gone down. But so what has been happening, because this has been happening every year after the budget is voted, we have had to add staff every year, two, three, four staff members driven by IEPs, so we're required to do it after the budget closes. And where we get the funding for that is circuit breaker. So what has happened is that that reserve or revolving fund has been depleting because now we are spending in this current year as opposed to, you know, we get paid the year after. So um, is it yep. it's fair to say like sort of robbing Peter to pay Paul? So co combined effect of the reimbursement rate going down, our costs going up, and having to have been doing that for the last couple of years incrementally, all of those things are coming due all at the same time this year. Um, yeah, for, for illustration purposes, I think probably five years ago we would carry a, a three to four hundred thousand dollar circuit breaker balance. At post budget this year, I think it's projected to be something like twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, because it, it, to it, it's not that it's gone from seventy five or seventy three percent to sixty five percent in one year. It's been going down incrementally year over year. So every year we're getting a little bit less, but expecting to be able to offset. Um, and we've been adjusting our budget projections, but it's been going down at a rate that exceeds even a reasonable budget projection. And just so that just continues to run us in the red until right. we're going to run out of money in that account. And just to, to respond to in terms of enrollment, we've had 55 new students move into the district since October 1st, <coughs> um, which is, you know, a lot. And we've had two move out. Yeah, two. Um, is the growth, is, is the new growth in uh, our... our base population, school population, uh, and the growth in the requirements for the, you know, uh, for SPED or any other special programs, is it kind of commensurate with what the population is well, before what that group comes in? Yeah, so what we're seeing is in addition to all of this, and this is not just the move-in, well, it, it is the move-ins, um, we have had in the last, I don't remember if it's the one year or two year, we've had a 102% increase in our English language learner population. Okay. So in a larger district, you would have a department that handled that. We have a staff member at each building. So we've already added that, a staff member to address that this year. We're already over what the recommended, you know, caseload is um, for those students. And, uh, you know, we anticipate because a lot of the, um, South American school districts and at, in December, we actually are anticipating probably an influx in um, in the new year as well. I mean, we don't know for sure, but so we're teetering right on the brink of already not having enough staff to provide those services this year, despite having added one. Um, so, so that is also, it's not just the numbers, but it's also the needs that the kids are coming with. Um, and so, you know, and, and to John, John's point earlier, all of those services are <coughs> required but not supported um, by the state, and so um, yeah, so so there's that, and um, we you know we are working. We do have a great um, 18 to 22 program for our students, but we do also you know when those students are outplaced, the the town is responsible for those placements as well. I think that's maybe something that people aren't generally aware of and comes as a bit of a surprise, but for our special education students, we're required to educate them from age three to age 22. Um, and so that's just a broader span than our gen ed students and probably broader than what people. Um, What's that portion of our budget right now? Well, to be truthful, so our actual, if you take out the 2% that Brian was talking about, which is mostly our out of district, our actual special education budget only went up by 1.2 percent. So just as Norman was describing, some of the town departments are coming in <coughs> under. Some of our, but uh, some of our school departments are coming in under. But these big ticket items, if you will, are sort of obscuring that fact. So that's about a lot of the investment that we've made in terms of full day K and co-teaching and 
Um, so then I don't understand, is, is that growth people coming from other district districts into ours or us sending kids from our district to others? Both. Okay. So, so, you know, the um, standard is to educate students in the least restrictive environment and so always we try the best we can to keep them in Hawkington, mm -hmm. but there definitely are some students for whom our services are not sufficient and they so then they would go to an outplacement and we work hard to find them a placement within the context of one of the collaboratives that we belong to but you know that doesn't always work um, so if we have to set if we have to pay when we send <coughs> ours out how come we're not getting paid when others are no coming oh I see what you're saying I'm talking about so f just to use one example we've had several students who are already, we have several students who enroll in Norfolk Aggie from Hopkinton. Um, and it, it is included in our special education budget, even though it's not a special education per se outplace. But um, so we already plan for the number of kids in Hopkinton who we know are applying and are going to Norfolk Aggie. What we've actually had this year is several kids who are already students at Norfolk Aggie who live in a different town. Their family has moved to Hopkinton. So now we're taking on that payment. Okay. And so the same would be true if there was, if there was a student placed in, um, I, I'm gonna make one up, per, the Perkins School, for example, that lived in another town, but then moved to Hopkinton. Now Hopkinton mm -hmm. is responsible for, mm -hmm. um, okay. for the payment and the education for that student. And so combination of all of those things really is what's, I mean, I, you know, I, I just wanna say, we have sticker shock just like you do. I mean, this is, mm -hmm. You know, I've been around you and, and Brian and I have been a lot around long enough to have done the 0.74% increase across the town. Uh, so these numbers are are shocking to, to me, but uh, you know, I, Brian has um, been to all of our, our budget meetings. We really are down to talking about pencils at this point. Um, How many of those can you cut? Yeah. We got so computers we spent That's, that's 10 a point minutes. of contention between me and John, but um, you know, we're at the point now where the only other place to go is programs or teachers. And before we start that investigation or create that panic, we really wanted to have the opportunity to hear where the whole town was. I'm really um, I'm grateful that Norman's able to plug these numbers in because I know when we met in September for our joint meeting, the um, opportunity to use that that interactive um, spreadsheet and sort of see in real time what the impact was uh, is something that we haven't really explored before and I think you know just how quickly he was able to do that is um, you know to me tremendously valuable and gives us some help in our context so we we haven't obviously voted our budget yet we're going to continue to be doing our homework as I said we're going out to um, bid or we already have gone out to bid on our bus contract and that is due on January 2nd and we vote on January 11th so we're hopeful that we'll get some good news there but as Brian said I mean that's you know that's a $300 $300,000 increase that we're carrying but we have a $900,000 problem yeah. um, so you know that may move the needle a little bit but it's not going to solve everything so the other night we spent 10 minutes literally trying to figure out, not, not in great detail, but the, the, the level to which they're going was the type of crayons and the brand of crayon and which crayon lasts the longest for the marathon school as they, as they build their inventory for what they need and, you know, what the value is to buy crayon X that will break in three days versus crayon Y, which will break in seven days and the return on investment. I mean, they're down to the brass tacks here as they try to figure this thing out. And I think, too, you know, this is my seventh budget I guess but cycle through this between appropriations and school committee is this is this is it is a sticker shock to see a number this big and the the leadership team has done a phenomenal job at identifying things with teachers that will advance the the, the educational program but there's nothing in here that's like a big ticket program enhancement that we can say that we can sit here and debate the merits of that like that's not what's driving this budget this is not like when we talked about full day kindergarten a few years ago right this is right no this no is, initiatives the, the, there's there are no yeah there are no significant initiatives in, in is there anything either. you guys can make a marathon fund request for <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know that that marathon fund balance is going to help your hockey team just yeah. did <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and, I, and I've been at the at at these uh, um, budget meetings 
for the, for the last few months. You know, and, and we even we even you know <coughs> you know we ask those tough questions. You know, we're talking about level services right here. You know, and the level of excellence. You know, because where we have the, the 151st best school system in the country, the third best high school in the in, in, the, in the state. You know, and we even ask those questions. Well, what about just staying in the top 10? Do we save money? But then, how do you how do you quantify it? You know, wh what do you cut? What do you do? And and we really ask those tough questions. And and the school committee really did look at those at those things. Um, you know, it, it was still, there were no holds barred at these meetings. We talked about everything, just like Brian was talking about the, the you know the crayons at the uh, at, at the other meetings. And um, you know, because it, uh, you know, at one point it was eight percent. You know, and you guys. I think we started at nine. Not yeah. that that yeah. I don't know that it makes you feel a lot better, but we are trying. No, no, and and, and yeah, because and, and we did ask those those tough questions, and you know, if people out there think that we we were just no, and I and I have no yeah. doubt of that, and um, you know, I know that you guys are always looking out for the for the good of the kids and the education system in Hopkinton, which really trickles down to you know on a colder side. You know, helping property values and things like that for the residents of Hopkinton. Uh, never question, you know, your your ethic and the fact that you're going at this hard. Right now, my main thing is just trying to figure out something that can uh, protect the taxpayers uh, from from that base number anyway, and the increases that are allowable year after year. Yeah. And so, even understanding that, you know, this year, you know, maybe it does come out to be seven percent. You know, moving forward, you know, if something happens and a bunch of people move out of town or whatever, that they were contributing to that big increase. I'd yeah. like to make sure that that's not hitting the base if there's a way, if there's yeah. a legal way. And we had, we did have a conversation about that at our last um, budget advisory meeting because I was remembering um, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, when there was um, a really big override requested that failed and we had to go back to town meeting like in June. Um, and they ended up, we ended up passing a smaller override and taking money out of stabilization um, to sort of do that reset. So, you know, it is far beyond my level of expertise to identify what is a one-time, you know, non-recurring versus what would go into the base. I think a lot of what we're talking about, because it's real kids in real placements and in real chairs in our schools, um, I don't know the extent to which but I, but I think that those are, are questions we all have to pursue. I know, uh, you know, on the sheet that um, it looks like we're contributing to stabilization. I don't know what the total is that's in there, and I understand the implications about, or I don't understand. I just know that there are implications around bond rating and all, all of that stuff. But I think, um, you know, that's why I think it's really important that we all work together because there's there's got to be something that we can do to soften this blow um, a little bit but I would caution a, a lot of the, the the main drivers we're talking about though are inherently base items yeah. right so the, the transportation yeah. contracts three year contract the yeah. school you know this, this increase in utility costs those kinds of things are are, uh, are unfortunately they they are just yeah. base items yeah, that, that are all hitting yeah. at the same time I will say our our um, all of our building principals are basically raiding the center school for their <laughs> supplies so any desks and kidney tables are very popular chairs uh, anything that they can um, salvage from the center school as they move out into the marathon school um, to save money off their budget but also to save the town the cost of however that gets disposed of um, you know we really they've made every effort to do that as well um, so we really are you know trying to look under every rock but we appreciate that this is not what you asked us to do um, but a again the vast preponderance of this is non-negotiable you know outplacements and utilities and bus transportation um, so the so the numbers since October one are fifty five new students on a thirty four seventy five roughly I think that's the number for enrollment today that's one point six percent growth in kids since October and those kids have parents and they've got other you know family members and then our police have a little bit more act activity and our firefighters have a little bit more activity 
and we've got the transportation of moving those kids back and forth. I mean, just if you think about the growth of this, the, the town, it's coming home to roost, you know, for all of us. We have talked about this coming for a couple of years, though. Mm -hmm. This shouldn't be new to the residents of Hopkinton. This is the year the library's on. This is the year the new school's going in. This is the year the DPW's going in. This is the year people are moving to town because all these other developments post the recession came online. So here we are. I mean, this is this is what we we have seen this coming for several years, and now it's time to sort out how we're going to pay for it. We have um, a question on on how the space is being used, and and I know you guys have been cutting every bit of, uh, even to use the word fat is inappropriate because I think there's clearly no no fat here and, and we've been talking. Um, but just on how that, you know, the eight or ten new teachers, I understand we're having this tremendous growth in kids. Um, how, how that space is being used in, in the new Marathon School? Because I know we all want to keep our class sizes down. I know that they've been really, really crowded at Center School. Um, my recollection, as the, as the Marathon Project got underway, we recognized that we were even over the mm -hmm. uh, projections and were able to scramble and go back and get some more funds to add new classrooms while it was all in the process. And I, I thought it was like, we need like, two classrooms. And they said, well, you're not going to build two, you build four, so you build a wing. And now we've got it, and it'll be there for future growth, so we've got four new classrooms. Um, so because those four new classrooms are there, part of it for future growth. Are we filling those four new classrooms? I mean, I, I don't want to be filling space just because we have it no. and then adding teachers to those rooms when uh, those were there not for agree. a need. No, absolutely agree. No, we're filling three um, to, to accommodate the population. So we still have one that's, <coughs> that's not going to be filled. Um, the other thing, you know, as John alluded to earlier, so the one situation that we have at the center school with the kindergartners particularly is that we really have to have two adults in the room at all times so we have the classroom teacher and we have dedicated paraprofessional um, because there are no bathrooms in the room and just they have 25 five-year-olds in the room um, so in the transition to the marathon school one thing that this is what I was talking about with headcount one thing that we've been able to do is um, spread the paraprofessionals out a little bit more so we now have one professional for every two rooms mm -hmm. so we've been able to reduce that head count but with the increase in classroom teachers and those are not equivalent in cost um, but just in terms of that's sort of how the head count changes and then because of the size of the building we are having to add one custodian mm -hmm. over what we have it so overall the head count at the building is increasing by two but it's not all apples and and we to the point about the the class size I mean obviously the class size has been something that the community has felt strongly about it was brought up again in our, our revised strategic plan a few years ago um, what what the what mrs. Debo was doing at at the marathon school is even with at using the three additional classrooms her starting baseline is is just slightly below our target for um, kindergarten and first grade so we target I think it's 18 and 20 for kindergarten and first grade the, the kindergarten projection based on NESDAQ is right around a little over 17 right now and um, first grade is right on 20 again using historical trends these are not going to be classes of 17 kindergartners we're going to get a lot more kindergartners between now and then and so what she didn't want to do was sort of budget it out for shorting you know not using those three classrooms say you know start at 18 end up at 20 kindergartners and realize then we've got to come back and add teachers. Mm -hmm. We, I mean, the recent history has told us, and anecdotally, um, the off, both central office and the center school office are getting a lot of phone calls from people asking when the new school's opening. So I would expect you're going to have a lot more um, move-ins this summer in anticipation of that new school coming online. So uh, that's kind of why we've staffed it the way we have in the budget to make sure we can absorb that. Okay. okay, thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Kamalo, um, anything else? Because we really have to move on to Yeah, I have, yeah. I haven't been able to talk yet. Oh, okay. So, Mr. Kamalo, I would like to find a way to make sure, and this is kind of going outside of the school. It has nothing to do with the schools, but it has to do with the, with the budget update. Mm -hmm. I would like to make sure, or find a way to make sure that whoever has the ability 
is a thousand percent on their game that we have the I don't know how to say this without stepping on something um, so that the the apartments in town th these new apartments that are in town I'm hearing through pretty reputable people that it may be a two-bedroom apartment but there might be eight kids in there so I don't know how that works with the schools where if, if we're budgeting if we're figuring that there's going to be 400 apartments and say there's going to be 2.3 kids in each one of those apartments well now that these families that are coming in with significant and, and there might be multiple families that are living in the same apartment we need to I need to know in my heart that we're a thousand percent on top of our game that we have a very very accurate count of how many people are in each apartment and that they're not exceeding the occupancy rules and that we can that way we can more accurately forecast and project what we're going to need for for schools fire police dpw assistant town managers um yeah. <laughs> so i think it's a real problem because i don't know if if the numbers that are being reported to the town are accurate and I don't know if that's if that's Chucky Cadlick and Mike Shepard doing it. I don't know if it's. You can't ask. What? You can't ask. We can't ask. So if we have a family that that rents a two bedroom apartment and there's 75 kids in there, how can we not ask that? Mr. It's Fire Chief, is that not a, a safety hazard to have mm -hmm. too many people living in 15 kids in one bedroom? It is. So we need to be more on top of our game. And I know I probably shouldn't have brought this up at the meeting. I should probably should have called you beforehand, but <laughs> this just jarred my thought yeah. process. I'm a little confrontational tonight, in case you haven't picked on that. <laughs> um, so Skittles. <laughs> I need the lithium Skittles. So, and, uh, so I just think if we're not maximizing the tax revenue that, we're, that we should be getting from these people. So, so maybe this family's in a two bedroom, maybe that family should be in a four bedroom now. And now that, now that they're gonna, now we're gonna start getting more tax revenue from it. And, and we're gonna be more accurate. We're gonna be able to say, okay, there's definitely gonna be 17 students in a room because we know that there's the proper amount of occupancy in, in each of these buildings. I know you're, point, this yeah, is no. a pregnant pause, I get it, <laughs> yeah. and then you're going to say, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 again, I, I think your, your point is well taken. Mm -hmm. we, will, we will review your request. For the, for the sake of the public at home, there's only one development in town where we are tracking the number of students on a regular basis based on an agreement between the town and the developer, mm -hmm. namely at Legacy Farms. Yep. We don't have that agreement or arrangement with other developments in town. But your point is well taken, we will look into it. Thank you, sir. And then on, on the numbers, I just wanted to throw the chair. Just to be clear, um, I was looking at two different sets of data. The expenses that are increasing based on the model, model that we, we, we put out are under general government, public safety, Hopkinton Public Schools, employee benefits and insurance. I should mention debt service is staying the same, 8.5, and the actual number based on the most recent uh, tax rate setting process is 8.5 million. And then, also, under capital, uh, and, 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 and other uh, fixed costs. Pop OPEP trust, we are just wrapping up on the actual valuation of our OPEP. Indications are that our annual obligation, should the board agree to a strategy where we want to fully fund OPEP over 30 years, will go up, that is the annual con contribution, will go up from about 450000 to $1 million. Again, that's a number that's out there. We're still reviewing that. We haven't finalized our review process, and we'll be discussing that issue with the board. On the revenue side, as I mentioned, originally we had projected 5.1 million. 
for local revenues, that number is down to 4.5 million. And then, just to be clear, on free cash, we were at $2.2 million in 18. That number is now down to $1.8 million. And then on the new growth assumption, in FY18, confirmed at 2.7 million, that number is down to 1.8 million. Just wanted to make sure that those numbers were clear to the board. Mr. Chair, before we move on, I, I'm all for sorting through these numbers as we get go forward into February and March. But we're bringing on, I don't know, $60 million worth of assets this year, right now. And so in my view, for our balance sheet, if we had a balance sheet per se, our balance sheet is going to look pretty good because we're bringing on all these assets. Why do we need to throw another million dollars in the stabilization? I'm not saying what that, that's the number. Uh, OPEB, I get the, the long-term liability there or responsibility there. But I'm not sure this is the year we need to be throwing cash into other accounts when we're throwing cash into buildings that are bricks and mortar that still maintain a healthy financial picture for the community. Just something to think about as we go forward. Was that a long debate, Brian? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Move to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Yeah, we, we, we had 15 minutes per way. We have a motion on the table. Okay, we, did it, we did it in an hour. Okay. Um, downtown corridor project. The board is left will hear an update on the Main Street corridor project, including the Mass Dot 25% submission. Comments and public hearing, Church Street traffic flows, Marathon Way, and undergrounding of utilities. Exciting stuff. Dave, the town manager's update used a half hour of your time, so you have <laughs> right about 10 minutes left. Uh, yeah. Tell me what you want to go over. Well, make sure we touch on it. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, start us up. Get us yes. on track. Get yeah. us um, back on track. Exactly. Nine minutes. She's now getting from both sides. Yes. Yeah, by, by way of introduction. Yeah. Yes. By way of introduction, Dev Del Torio, town engineer. John Bouchard, the consultant from VHP, who's leading the uh, design and, and planning for this project. Um, we thought it was necessary for town staff to come back and have a conversation with the board now that uh, a couple of things have happened. The public hearing for Mass DOT is now confirmed. It's going to be on January 9th next year. Secondly, now that the project has been under review at Mass DOT <coughs> relative to the 25% design. <coughs> and we've also completed, I was counting, no less than perhaps 18 or 19 meetings uh, since February. We felt it was important that we come back to the board and report on the progress made so far. Therefore, you're going to hear from the consultants and Dave uh, our conversations, our ongoing conversations with Mass DOT, what their comments are on the 25% design, the comments that we have received from the public relative to the 25% design, and also uh, some of the comments that we have received from uh, several stakeholders in town, including the Chamber of Commerce, town boards, etc. Thank you very much. With that, uh, John, Dave. Take us through it a little bit. Take us down the road. I think the best place to start. Um, Is that the beginning? At the beginning. Well, well, oh, everybody's getting old. When we submitted the project to MassDOT, um, was it June? June. Yeah, May, June. Yeah. Um, it, uh, May and June time frame. Um, John could possibly go through some of the, the major uh, comments that MassDOT um, had on the project, and if they will required us or asked us to incorporate any, any changes to the plan that we presented to you folks um, last time, which I think it was in April. Yeah. Might have been the last time we were here. So. Yeah. Well, there haven't been um, 
I don't want to say that there haven't been significant. You need to change this, or this this was not. You know, this doesn't meet our standard or anything like that. There there are some tweaks in in the project, um, and uh, some of the things that that they have uh, that MassDOT and you know, there's there's like 17 different sections that actually review. The, uh, the submission from the district office in Worcester with this uh, you know five or six different reviewers in different areas and then Boston there's another um, or uh, 10 or 12 um, and they review it from a right-of-way standpoint environmental traffic um, ADA uh, bike and ped accommodations and stuff like that there haven't been any significant you know you have to change this type of stuff but there have been some some uh, Areas that they, you know, that they would, uh, that we need to address. Um, there's been some discussion at each of the intersections, so at Wood Street, at Cedar and Grove, and then at um, Hayden Row and at Ash Street for, you know, improved uh, traffic flow along the corridor. So we have to do some additional, and, and most of this stuff is going to be done at the next stage, the final design stage, 75%, uh, where we do some traffic progression. Uh, matrices that show how traffic will progress from one end of the project to the other so we do some timelines um, but in general the separated bike lanes um, uh, accepted as as a good alternative for the likely users um, you know there's some some variations uh, in in uh, that we have two ways separated from Wood Street to Cedar, then we go to a single separated from Cedar to Hayden Row, and then we bring uh, the bike lanes into the roadway or into the uh, uh, adjacent to the travel lane in the shoulder from Hayden Row to Ash Street. And you know, it's it's the it's really required because Main Street changes. You know, at the very beginning of the project, uh, we can't just introduce something without having a transition. So most of the changes from on road to separated, from separated to single separated, and then to on road again, is really just to transition from what's existing along 135 west of Wood Street and what's existing on 135, and I know it's Main and West Main, different, but beyond Ash Street. So it's really the, that transition piece where we're on road, um, come into the single separated between, as I said, Hayden Row and, and Cedar is really that the cross section through there is, is, is a bit tight. So we had to kind of squeeze that in. And when we have um, the uh, single on each side, we're, we're able to transition from the traffic signal at Cedar and Grove up to Hayden Row. Uh, again, we're, we're trying to design the project for the likeliest, most prevalent users. And, you know, we have to address, you know, motor vehicles and trucks all forms of you know bicycle whether it's um commuter type bicyclists which we've heard from some of those higher end users i'll call them that will still want to be on road even though we have the separated bike uh lanes and then the more recreational or uh, what we consider again what we've heard from the upper charles trail committee you know probably the more prevalent users through the downtown would be you know families and others on a lower scale not a commuter type like you know just trying to get from one end of town to the other so we've incorporated that as you know kind of uh, incorporated from you know direction from uh, from this board and you know from uh, uh, from uh, when the project was first kind of you know put together and um, and then as I said transitioning to the uh, uh, what's going to happen up at Marathon Way and I think that's an area that is still I want to say a little bit in flux and um, you know the design has been submitted to DOT which incorporated you know the, the entire project limits and with closing of Marathon Way based on the input that we received at the time that a, kind of a decision had to be made we had to go forward with one concept and based on feedback from the the chamber um, from uh, members of uh, you know from the board in the town it was and from the Historic District Commission at least at the time it was we think this will work best for you know the alternatives now since that time we've met with the planning board we've met with the historic district commission and there's been kind of requests to in, in the bike the uh, public hearing public hearing a public info meeting that we had back in uh, the end of september we've heard some maybe some changes that may need to be incorporated and um 
there are, there's opportunities to, to make some of those changes and to make some tweaks. It's just that what DOT is going to present or what VHB in, in partnership with the town is going to present with MassDOT in, you know, on January 9th is going to be the plan that, that we've presently, you know, that, that's under review and it may not have every little nuance that we've talked about over the last several months because there have been some, some tweaks or at least discussions of tweaks. Um, so the um, Marathon Way at, is what's under review right now is closed and we have been having some ongoing discussions as I said with Planning Board, with uh, the uh, uh, Historic District Commission and then with the Upper Charles Trail Committee about what other options do we still have available to us up at Marathon Way because not everyone is fully sold on, on that concept. Um, but at least uh, at this point, we'll continue to take that comment and we'll work with the Historic District Commission, the Upper Charles Com Trails Committee on, you know, what do we really want to happen up there? How can we tweak it? There is, because of the uh, property being, you know, the Historic District, MassDOT and MEPA as part of the environmental permitting process is going to weigh in, but they take a lot of hard direction from the local Historic District Commission. So they don't try to shove something down and say, no, this is the way, but they do try to protect the cultural resources and his historical assets of the Commonwealth. So they understand there's gonna be a little give and take there, but we kind of had to make a decision at the time to go forward with something. And that seemed to be the prevailing wins, I'll say at the time, that the, you know, we had most of the support to go forward with that. So I think there's gonna be you know, some ongoing um, shifting and tweaking of that particular area. Um, after we get through the public hearing stage. And uh, a major piece of that, obviously, is the, the permitting with Mass Dot, uh, Mass, Historic Com District, Mass Historic Commission, excuse me, uh, and then we'll continue to work with the local Historic District Commission on, you know, on that piece. Uh, but we are waiting for some new information from the Upper Charles Trails Committee because they have been looking at incorporating, you know, connection to the center school in that area with, uh, with the trails and saying maybe some form of marathon way you can use and I haven't seen that final concept yet, but they're, they're working internally right now. So that's why I said I, I wanted to kind of at least hit that point because I've had a lot of discussion, I've had some calls on it. Um, and DOT is just like, we'd like to kind of make a decision on some of this stuff so we can go forward, but they understand there's going to be a little give and take as we, as we finalize things. Um, the other pieces that we've really heard on the project, um, you know, there's a couple of crosswalks and a couple locations that, you know, are mid-blocks that, mm, geez, they're really not great visibility. Is, are you sure you want to, you know, retain these here? But there are, there are pedestrian connectivity and, you know, through the entire downtown that we want to maintain. So there's a few areas that we might look at some other, uh, uh, like uh, flashing beacons to, to call out that pedestrians might be in an area uh, that a, a motorist may not necessarily think that there might be someone in the middle of the road at that location. Obviously, we have the flashing beacon up near Bills now, which is, you know, I'm not sure what the feedback is from the town, but at least it's, it's been used. And um, I haven't heard that there have been a lot of, uh, a lot of um, uh, accidents or, let's say, near misses since then, but they're saying it's been used. Has it been well received? Are there area, other areas in town along Main Street that this might be a, um, uh, you know, a, a safety uh, benefit in a couple other locations and you know so we're going to continue to evaluate that as we get through the final design phase of the project um, the uh, uh, the intersection designs at, at each of those locations um, you know DOT is is more about moving people more efficiently and quickly through town and um, so sometimes there may be some suffering in the in uh, in uh, you know the capacity is 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 a concern, but they'd like to get traffic moving more quickly through town, and, and we're trying to say we got to balance moving traffic more quickly with maintaining as much parking as we can, maintaining as much pedestrian and bicycle accommodation as we can. So it, it's a little bit counterintuitive. So it's always a balance. We have to walk a really fine line on those types of things. So as much as they want to see improved operations there's still the balance of we have to provide better safety for all users not just motorists getting through town faster um, but they're also not always in favor of the the uh, improved uh, parking for businesses because as i said they have a couple of different goals in mind to move more efficiently and uh, you know working with cities and towns as we do and the businesses we know there's some challenges there we, we have to continue to try and enhance um, 
that safety and um, uh, connectivity to parking. You know, if it's right in the downtown or a couple of off-site lots or on side streets, you know, it's something we're going to continue to work hard on with uh, input from this board as well as from the chamber. I mean, those are, you know, those are the ways that the project's going to be successful because going and putting a layer of asphalt and putting a bike lane uh, separated or not along Main Street it is not going to, you know, it's not going to meet the needs of the town. It, it's going to, maybe it's going to address some of the, some of the uh, progression things that DOT would like to see, but it's not really going to be the bigger benefit. And I think that's what's going to be, you know, we need the input of, of the board, uh, the, the chamber, and then uh, input at the uh, public meeting to really, you know, let's, let's talk about the things that are really important so we can make sure we're focusing on them, try to enhance them better, um, and get them adopted as, you know, as part of the project. So I think kind of, oh, yeah, through the chair, it may be helpful also to introduce Church Street. Well, I was just going to. Right, uh, Dave, Dave was, I didn't want to hit, Dave has a couple of points. I got to let him have his time in the, yeah. up front. Yeah. The, um, so uh, some of the feedback, again, this is more of a, call it a sidebar, but it's, it's been a, an ongoing discussion. Um, it was with the original design through beta, uh, it's gone through the library project, uh, the site plan review process. There was always a discussion on, um, as well as this project, um, as a safety improvement, it was to make Church Street one way from Main Street to Church Place. Um, the library project had done a traffic study and a traffic analysis as part of that project. Uh, that was presented to the planning board. Um, and the planning board, one of their conditions was actually, you know, to, to make Church Street one way there and, and have right turn only, um, you know, in, um, in <laughs> I might back myself up one way, <laughs> this way. <laughs> yeah. Where are we going? One way out of Church Street. Going, going north on Church Street? Uh, correct. Is the one way direction. Right, so it's right turn on only, right turn onto Main Street. So from Church Place to Main Street would be one way. Now, the, the, there's already, you know, I think it's Sunday, that, that street um, is one way during church. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's already at certain times that that's a one-way street. Portion of it is a one-way street. Um, I guess the, the, as the road commissioners, you folks would ultimately make that decision. Uh, it's not that I, I'm asking tonight for a decision. I, I think you know, process would be, you know, what input would you like to see, and, and possibly I'm not sure how um, that process is, what, as, as the commissioners, how that decision is made, and what other input you like, you would like from a proponent in order to make a decision. Yeah, I actually drove down. I, I go to church every Sunday, and I have to go right. But on uh, last Friday, I took a left, and there was parking on both sides, and a guy coming towards me. I didn't know if I was going to get down. It, it, it was sort of it was it was almost like a Rubik's cube, trying to figure out how I was going to get down. We were dodging each other, going in and out, and we then finally there was three cars coming up, me going down. It's like, oh, you come first, and then I'll move over here. Then you come up, then I'll move over here, and you go down. Yeah, so one way on that doesn't seem. Quite logical, and maybe only parking on one side of the street. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be the, the intent. It, the, the actually the road itself it is unless we go to narrow cars or something. Curb to curb, it's too narrow for parking on two sides of the street. Even uh, in some areas, if it was one way. So, yeah. to your point, it would likely be parking on one side of the street. Cool. Yeah, so Mr. Chair, um, the input I would like to see on that is the neighbors, the people that live on Church Street and on Church Place be brought into this discussion because maybe part of the solution is not to allow parking on both sides. But right now, I'm afraid we're looking at this simply from the standpoint of the library and not working up the street to the other people who live on that street. I live in that neighborhood. I can tell you there are a lot of children in that neighborhood. There are children on Church Place that use that for their, they got their street hockey nets, they got the basketball things out. Every single car, all the traffic from the library is gonna be forced up into those na that neighborhood, which has a lot of kids in it. And it may work nicely for the library, 
but it may not work nicely for the people who live on that street. There are a lot of children, and so what I don't want to see happen is this thing slip through without the neighbors that live there be brought into a public hearing to weigh in because there will be an impact and there's a lot of children that are literally on those streets. We had the same thing on Walcott. Mm -hmm. when, when we had uh, guys being able to go in either direction pulling out of Walcott and, and you can't see. And, and you know that's why they made that end of it one way because it was just, you know, when it comes to safety, you know, like they were, we're talking Safety to wears many hats. And it may be children who use those streets and are, are in that area. The downtown is very dense. They don't all have the big lawns. Um, I'm just saying, these kids play their street hockey. They play their, maybe you don't put parking on both sides of the street. But if you make that a one way and all your library traffic, and the library's getting a lot of use now, is all going to be required. Every car coming out of that parking lot is going to come up Church Street and go down Church Place where there's children that are using that street. I mean, maybe that's what we'll do. This isn't the place to argue it. I'm just saying there are families and homes and children that are going to be impacted, and we need to hear from them. That's all I'm asking. Yeah, I have, uh, I don't remember, and I, I, we may have, but I don't remember voting Marathon, like this, getting rid of Marathon away. I don't remember voting on that. If we did, uh, we don't vote. We don't. No, we voted to we submit plans. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, that's one of my, one of my concerns is when you look at that intersection, um, if you can get me to Marathon way. Oh, sure. Um, so as you're coming eastbound, if you're a uh, school bus, mm -hmm. no, I guess the school bus is probably not the right thing there, but a, a, a delivery truck, a UPS truck, it's a pretty tough right-hand turn right there to, to come on and, and, uh, and take that right-hand turn onto <coughs> Ashley at that point. So um, we know we can't touch anything on the common or by the Doughboy because it's historical to lessen the angle. I mean, that's more than a 90-degree turn. Um, so uh, the, the getting rid of Marathon Way is just something that, uh, as I see it, it just pops a, a red flag into my, and I know we're not going to make any decisions today, but it's just something I want to put out there that, you know, to, to see, uh, or even a, a, a tractor trailer delivering bark mulch or loom or gravel or anything like that, to turn onto that is, it, it has the potential of doing some damage to that, uh, to that doughboy um, without lessening the angle of that. Well, we did put, um, we, we do, uh, you know, put turning templates on all the intersections with, with uh, different size design vehicles. And it's, the intersection has been designed so it can accommodate all legal, you know, vehicles that would be making that turn. So seem, some even, you know, track the, dub, track, track the trailer WB50 for deliveries and stuff. You know, it's not something I would see, you know, um, 10 a day, but it would be able to negotiate that turn. Um, but I, you know, I just and I just wanted to address that question or the comment that, you know, that um, uh, we we put all of the uh, various vehicles that would be making those turns on, you know, on every intersection, mm -hmm. and say if we're going to do this, then we have to do that. We have to pull back on parking or pull back on the curb line a little bit, and we and we're um, cognizant of the the doughboy and making sure that we're not encroaching anywhere on the curb line or anything like that. So we have at least done that, but. Um, to, to say that you know there's still a few uh, iterations and options to uh, to work that out and and yeah. uh, you know we'll work with the town on that as you know as uh, as needed to uh, make sure that gets um, say I don't want to say rectified but you know so it get, it meets the needs of the community yeah there so there are some businesses like the slaughterhouse down there would would have a, a truck with a yep. long trailer that comes through a, a, the ladder truck if the ladder truck had to go down that. Um, uh, Dump trucks, school buses. Have, we put school well, buses, school delivery buses. trucks, and at, at least we can it can buses. make that. School and, buses uh, can, can go down. Yeah. Right, not anymore. But I mean, but we, but you know, we we yeah. still put the, that's the most likely. Even if it's a, you know, can be a, a you know a, a, a trip, or it could be someone who you know could be a a, a private bus, Peter Pan bus. Someone yeah. books a trip and they, you know, they used to meet at Marathon Way because it was wide open and they could do that. So yeah. we put all the different vehicle templates on there to make sure that. They can negotiate those terms. Okay. Brian, are we going through our questions or comments now? Yeah. Okay. Um, 
So if we do something with Marathon Way, leave it in, but have you on that side, would that preclude us from growing the comment on the left side there a little bit where that bump out is and that little round curve and so on? Uh, I don't I don't think it would preclude us, but I, you know, I mean, some of, them, some of yeah. the previous alternatives that, yeah. you know, th that bump out, you know, was pretty standard, I think, on, on most of the options. And, and what the intent was to, you know, separate that, you know, right now it's just a, an airport out there. Um, it's to separate that gotcha. traffic. I, I mean, I like that. I, I, the idea of growing the common, I, I like that, but I certainly understand the concerns and the you know, the historic concerns, but also the mm -hmm. traffic concerns. So whatever we all sort out over time with the Marathon Way, I'm, I can figure that out too. Mm -hmm. But wherever we can grow the common and it makes sense to do so, I, I'd be good with that as well. Right. Uh, so that's one thought. And then um, this is all including undergrounding from the police station to the common, correct? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Okay. And um, um, going back to the main intersection, that includes that our friends at CVS are uh, cross point helping us correct that intersection, yes. right? Yes. And that green space there is in fact green space going to be added into that intersection? Correct. Correct. Okay. I'm good, thank you. Mr. Sestari. And, and I would just add, you know, one one comment on the, the Marathon Way, the different options. You know, the options were Marathon Way was to remain one way. The changes at the Ash Street, Main Street inter intersection weren't as drastic um, compared to the option where you have, you know, the Marathon Way being closed. And the, the intent with that is, is because you're, you're going to have all the traffic now turning down Ash Street, which is quite obvious. So this was being widened considerably compared to you know the other option where marathon way was was being one way so um, again there was some you know the design had to incorporate every other vehicle turning down ash street just, in that design point. right there the the island for the doughboy is much longer correct left to right I, yes okay yeah, and, and one of the other things is that, that we've been into in, in many discussions with the BAA because you know that is that is the start and and we wanted to make sure that that we could incorporate the uh, the, the bleachers and the you know the, the, any of the stuff that they need for the start you know any stanchions that they might need in the future so so you know all of these discussions you know we have made sure that we we have um, we have their input also because we don't want to um, uh, ruin the, the start of the marathon by, by making any of these changes. If we go to the this January 9th public hearing sponsored by the Department of Transportation, mm -hmm. and we have a microphone there or two, I'm assuming, correct? And people mm -hmm. get to get up. And this turns into a bit of a, um, what was that expression? But it turns into a, uh, an energized topic. Okay. Well put. Um, is that going to be a problem as the Department of Transportation sits there and watches the town of Hockington in its, in its deliberations? Or is that common and then we can adjust after that? I'm just concerned that if we don't sort this out a little bit more, it's going to be a black eye for us one way or the other. If I'm, go ahead. If I may, um, for such projects, there is an expectation that there will be public feedback. And Master OT usually is fine with that. However, if the conversation at the local level is strongly in opposition to the project, that will definitely force Master OT to walk away from this project. Would you say the project as a whole is or just one element? Project. Yeah, well, that's my, I guess exactly. my point is one I get that this is a sensitive area and yes. the, of the project, but the rest of the project, I, it's well, awesome. Yeah, right. I don't want to. I, I don't want to to, to ruin a, a good design because yeah. it's not perfect right now. Because when we're talking about the underground, we're talking about fixing up the no, Grove Street and some of these, and, and narrowing that, narrowing the, the road so people don't have to go to 200 yards to cross in front of the Korean Church. 
you know, all of these things are important, and you know, and I think that we should be able to just step back and work out some of these details afterwards. Uh, but uh, you know, just to, to 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 go four years now, you know, and and, and then get uh, get nothing out of it. Well, it, yeah, but it, I guess I don't I don't have the answer to my question yet. So. I was gonna wait. I was gonna wait until there's another question. You're I, a I was very patient try. guy. <laughs> well, no, I th I thought town manager. You know, the, the let me let me say that um, MassDOT was at the public info forum that we had at the senior center back at the uh, end of September, and they thought that you know there was some spirited discussion of certain items, but they thought that there was general support for the project in a couple of areas that needed to be. Um, maybe some additional more additional focus um, if there is a lightning rod type of issue at the common where there's a you know significant opposition then you know there's a potential that the project could be derailed and I realize it's it may only seem like it's oh it's only this little piece but it's it's an important piece because it has historical um, and cultural resource um, concerns which have to go through several permitting agencies at the state federal and local level um, so they would be okay with the fact that there was spirited discussion and that there was there needs to be some some additional you know work to to come to a resolution um, and you know as i said they attended the meet the the prior meeting so they they know what what the discussion points are but if they felt that you know we walked away from there with some if they interpret it as significant opposition they would pull us aside and you know you know with Dave or without Dave and say this is an area you guys got to get this figured out and it's going to be figured out very soon because they're going to be you know kind of voting on their tip projects and if they don't think it can be resolved in the window they don't want to obviously lose the money so they'll they'll bump the project forward a couple years or bump it and say the town needs to get it back on the tip and I mean I'm, I'm talking you know kind of one of those uh, alternate scenarios but you know I don't I don't know every little detail but that's generally if they see something that hasn't that's that's kind of risen up then they can they can derail things a little bit let me share a piece of information which may provide helpful guidance to you folks and it may lessen the opportunity for a spirit of discussion that Brian is discussing. Um, as you know, the historic district is focused on this intersection. After the meeting in September, they held a site walk, which had a extremely big turnout for a site walk. There were probably over 20 people that attended, got a lot of feedback. They received a lot of letters with concerns from veterans with the import of the Veterans Triangle, from the Upper Charles Trails Committee relative to the bike path, from the Marathon Committee relative to how it's used for marathon setup, um, from neighbors who feel quite certain that a lot, of, a lot of the traffic will be cutting down their side streets. There were a lot of aspects. There were people that felt, um, from a safety standpoint, Marathon Way serves as a very nice, safe, secondary road for parking, strollers, uh, you're setting up something like a poly arts. It's a wonderful secondary, ac safe secondary access when you're setting up something on the common. Lots of, lots of feedback came out at the site meeting. They held their meeting in November and had a large turnout of people representing veterans, marathon, neighbors, et cetera. So they got a lot of feedback back um, as well as written feedback. Um, the upshot of that was that they just met last week. They met on Thursday night and voted as a board to send a letter of recommendation to both the town and VHB, I believe, that uh, they now are um, recommending that we look at one of the other four alternatives that did not involve closing Marathon Way, but involved keeping the Veterans Memorial Triangle, keeping Marathon Way as a one-way, but working with one of those other four alternatives that maintained the Marathon Way in some way or shape. Um, it all, those other four alternatives also showed more parking overall for the town than would be gained or not gained if, if you know, this 
went forth. So um, I know I did talk with the chairman or contact the chairman this afternoon asking where the letter was that she hadn't had, had a chance to send it since Thursday, but that will be forthcoming. So I know there's a couple people just in the audience in the community uh, tonight who had concerns about Marathon Way, and I just did want to report that, that that is a recommendation that will be coming from the district to uh, look to one of those alternatives as opposed to closing Marathon Way. Okay. Um, Mr. Cavallo, anything else? I'm up there on underground utilities. You yeah. know, the project still includes underground utilities. There, there are still some questions from, you know, the 18 meetings that we've had. You know, um, proceeding with that and uh, the cost of that, and we presented those costs at the public hearing. Um, and just in general, questions from the public. Will the project be going to town meeting? We, obviously, there's easements involved, so again, then there would be obviously this project would be planned to go to town meeting this town meeting uh, in order to meet the tip schedule. So, and you know, the project manager sooner than later, as John had mentioned, we, we, as a town, we've got to come to a, a resolution on it. You know, there's, and there's, you know, there's, there's lots of parts, you know, if, you know, there's, you know people, some people are upset about parking, some people are upset about everything, but again, we have to look at this from, from 10,000 feet and hopefully, you know, that, that there's more good than bad in the, in, in, in the entire project. So as we look at this project and we think about January 9th and we think about the comments specific to the DOT saying, I don't know, something going on around here, we're out of here, which we don't want to happen. Um, the only thing I can think of from Ash Street to Wood Street where that might happen and where other than we have a couple discussions about parking spaces I think I think we've resolved the center in the, the Main Street uh, Grove and uh, whatever Route Cedar, 85 intersection Cedar Street, Street thank you um, I think that's generally resolved in the community I think uh, the Wood Street kind of backing down from a bigger scale over there is resolved in the community. I don't see any really difficult topics left to sort out that could cause the problems that I'm concerned about, except for this here on the far right side of the plan. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to figure out a way to have that at least further discussed and some general decision made in advance of that January 9th meeting, because I'm worried it's gonna blow up in our face, and if it blows up in our face, we're gonna lose millions of dollars in funding for at least several years to get this work done again. Well, the if way I, I may. Oh, sure, sure. I, I think we, we were very grateful for the update from, um, from Claire, Claire Wright, uh, that, it, that we will be receiving uh, an outline of the comments that the Historic District Commission would like us to be aware of, as we have done multiple times in the recent past, we will meet with them immediately uh, because we want to resolve this also ahead of the hearing. They voted. Uh, uh, yes, and there was a vote. Yes, so time permitting, we will then bring that back to the board. But but yes, it has to go to the Historic District Commission yes. before because. We can't do. We can't direct them for something that didn't go to historic, because that, that's why that we got to where we are now. Is because historic voted on this, even though some people may disagree with historic, but they voted on this one. This is what they voted on. This is what, this is what passed the state. This is what passed the feds, and that's why we are here. So now, if if we can see where historic is now, you know, for the board doesn't that, that committee doesn't change again, that we can we can get back on track. Yeah, right, the second but, issue. But I'm just looking at timing. It's January 9th is the DOT hearing. Um, do we have a meeting between now no, and January we're not, we're not meeting to the 16th again. Yeah. Okay, we, so we, now we, there's my problem. Well, uh, but we will make this work. Right. We, 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 we can't work out the scheduling here. What we're grateful for is that we have received new information today that the Historic District Commission has compiled some comments for us. We've gone to the Historic District Commission multiple times. So we will continue working with them, and if there's need for the board to meet before the 9th, we'll certainly let you know. So we don't have to necessarily vote any changes before the 9th, correct? Vote to support any changes. 
again, for us, it is important that we get to the town, to, to, the, to the public hearing, the mass DOT sponsored public hearing, with clear positions from town boards. So my recommendation is that upon completing our conversations with the Historic District Commission, we will ask the Board of Selectmen to meet before the night. Okay. And then a couple other things. Um, there was a comment made earlier regarding um, Church Street. The traffic access and impact study that was reviewed by the planning board recommended that the one way be southbound, not northbound. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, and also, uh, we have a we have a memo. Yeah, we have a memo that we received that the board received uh, from the Chamber of Commerce, and I believe Mr. Kildaf is here to to share that memo with the board. Don't sit there. This is two, one minute. <laughs> You're on the clock. I know. Uh, well, can I pass this? Is this the first? same letter here? Yeah, but I want. I want to <laughs> see. I'll get credit if I do this. Quit like a runner. Right. <coughs> Paul Scott. Thank tomorrow. you. <laughs> um, oh yeah. Brian, if I may, I think your your comments are absolutely spot on. Uh, in terms of whatever process you take. The business community has been involved in this for a, a while. When we have meetings, uh, 30, 35 people show up. There's a lot of interest in this. But we'd be willing, prior to that uh, January 9th meeting, to bring that group together to review some sort of recommended change around the county. I think it's absolutely critical. To un if anybody underestimates what could happen at that meeting, it's a mistake. So we're happy to put our uh, strength, interest, and enthusiasm behind that, and we'll hold a meeting, if you want, uh, with property owners and business owners prior to that ninth meeting, if it's helpful. Your call. Just let us know. Thank you very much, Tim. Did you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to offer a framework. Uh, Stephen Campbell, uh, Park Street. Um, wanted to offer a framework, because uh, I've heard Mr. Bouchard speak uh, for a couple of meetings about the original intent and when they voted to grass over Marathon Way. And as I understand it from Mr. Bouchard, there were two parameters that his team was given. One was parking spaces, the other was green space. At that point, traffic flow was not discussed. And the marathon and the disability needs of the marathon were not discussed. The Upper Charles Trail Committee was not discussed. So that decision to grass over was not made with those other three parameters in mind. I suggest that we provide, or the selectmen provide some guidance to the engineers that includes all five parameters. So not just traffic spaces and green space, but traffic flow in particular, the needs of the marathon in particular, the wheelchairs, and the upper, trail, upper uh, Charles Trails Committee. I might add the distinctiveness of the Dubai Triangle. Uh, that's of concern to some people, but at least the top five. Uh, and safety, of course, being an issue. We don't want kids running over that hill if it's all grassed over. So there are a lot of young kids on the So that would be my request, to think of it in that terms of framework, expanding the original intent beyond the two parameters to at least five, maybe six. Yeah, and, well, and, and, well, and that's why I brought up the, uh, the BAA, because they were in all these discussions, and we were in many discussions right through the, even right through the summer, discussing uh, the, the movement of, of the, uh, the, dis the disability runners. In the wheelchair, and that's why it wasn't going to be one of the things. That it wasn't going to be grass. It looked like grass, but they were they were talking about a paver type material with grass growing through it, so it could take vehicles uh, driving on it, and, and, and that's it. So, so we did take consider all of those things, and there was, there was some of the stuff that they were talking about, because as I said, the the marathon is very important for that that part of town. Yeah. And, and uh, yes. Thank you, uh, Joe Markey, 39 App Street. And uh, I uh, have particular uh, enthusiasm and interest in this project, having been on the Downtown Revitalization Committee in 2009 and 10. 
and on the planning board when we uh, had the Conway School come in and create that voice and that, that vision for downtown uh, Hopkinton report that is at the foundation of all of this. So it's great to see it finally come to light. Um, and I, I love the whole project except this, this piece. So I agree with Brian uh, too on this, that the other things seem to have been worked out, but this one seems to have flip-flopped a bit, maybe due to the parameter issue that Stephen uh, just alluded to that came up at the September meeting. Uh, maybe other things, but um, as someone who uses that road a lot, um, I see uh, challenges with this that could lead to, uh, I don't believe there's traffic data on the impacts of this, uh, this configuration yet, but I could definitely see turning on to ash from Maine, turning right onto ash, that sharp turn will cause traffic to slow down and quickly back up past Hayden Road. So that's one concern. As soon as people realize that's gonna happen, they're gonna start using Hayden Row to get to Ash Street. They're gonna use Hayden Row in Fenton, Hayden Row in Pike, Hayden Row in Park, and those are the kind of streets that Claire was talking about earlier where kids are out in the street playing basketball. So uh, that's the concern that a number of the neighbors have in that area. And as far as, uh, if I can step back also in terms of uh, experience with these kind of projects, like this, the school building is one of these types of projects where you have hearings and there's percentages and don't worry, we can still make tweaks, but then you come to the next meeting, it's like, no, that was last meeting, it's too late now. So I would urge you to do what you can to get the town and the community on one page before January 9th or whatever it is with the DOT, uh, because it seems clear there's a new emerging consensus on what to do here, and it, now's the time to do it. I, I, I'm not comfortable with submitting uh, this plan and then calling it tweaks, because what we're talking about with leaving Marathon Way, a road that's a one way, it's not a tweak to what's shown on the screen right now. That's a different plan. So I think we need to uh, be very clear to the state in early January where we are. Well, uh, to, to, to that, I, I think the only thing we have to keep in mind is that um, at this point for the January 9th meeting, the only thing that we might even be able to vote on is what came out of uh, came out of Historic District, because other than that, we're, we're stuck, isn't it? Because we can only do what Historic District says. What, what do you mean, what came out of Histo Historic District? Did you say it was District, something was voted on? Historic District voted to recommend that the town not close Marathon Way and to go back to reconsidering one of those other four plans, one of those other four plans, all of which included keeping the Triangle and Marathon Way open as a one way. They didn't pick one of the four. They said, don't do alternative five, which is the closing. So they voted can, to- uh, John, can we get go to that meeting that open, or d does, does the Historic District Commission have to actually- Well, I mean, if, if the Historic District Commission has has voted and sent the letter, it, you know, it, it, it's, I don't want to say it's too late, but it's like, it's now going to be cut part of the public record. So it's, we're going to have to look to modify those, those options. I'm saying that the plan that's on the screen now is what's been submitted to DOT. And, but they will take the, they'll take the input of the historic district commission as, as, um, because of the cultural asset uh, of the common and the doughboy. They'll, they'll take them and say we'll work with you to make this make this better it's just we just have to be cautious of the you know this is a major issue when it's gonna it's gonna cause a, a delay in the project I think um, you know maybe uh, you know uh, we'll have to think about the right strategy at at the uh, public hearing to um, uh, to you know to try and um, I don't want I don't want to say minimize but to try and demonstrate to mass dot that the community isn't, you know, we're, we're just trying to come to the right solution here. And our initial feedback was that this would be a better alternative. But subsequent, we have a few other things we'd like to consider. Is this something we can con continue to work through? You know, and may I ask just for clarification? Initially, there were five alternatives, and the number f the fifth was the, was the grassed over plan that we're looking at. But there were four other semi engineered drawings of possible treatments for that same intersection. 
So I understand some of this has moved down the track with DOT with plan number <coughs> five, the grassed over, but there are four others that were already partly designed. But the so four other alternatives were not submitted to DOT. I understand that, but I think so then let's walk, let's, let's walk through what this. What saying is go with one of those four and we'll be good with it. But let's walk through this with the timing and with yeah. our, what's already been submitted. We had to submit a 25% to DOT. There it is. Yes. Okay? Done. We have a public hearing coming up on the 9th that DOT is sponsoring. It's part of their process where they're going to want to hear from the community. And we basically want the community to kind of be somewhat united around the concept here because everything else I think we're pretty much united on. Okay, and to get somewhat united around this, we have to consider this plan that's already been in and a couple of other alternatives based on historic district commission feedback, mm -hmm. as well as the views of this board, it's the submitting body to DOT, correct? Mm -hmm. We are the submitting body. Yep. Um, and then be ready to say, yes, this is what you have in front of you. This is what we'd like to go with, or yes, this is what we have in front of you but we've also had some additional feedback and we've got these other two and be able to throw them up and say these are other two ideas that we want to think about as well. Are you okay with that? If we have ourselves organized and ready to present a couple of ideas, they're going to be fine. If we're not organized and we're just up to the microphone saying, well, I think that sucks, or, you know what I mean? Then it's not going to go over very well at all. I'll be able to float this issue in front of DOT to, to be prepared for the, the night and I'll get back through Dave to uh, get to Norman and say, you know, what's, you know, make sure that if, if this is going to be, you know, try, uh, try to um, demonstrate that, this, you know, it's a cultural, it's a historic element. So we know that it's going to go through several iterations and be able to say that, look, our initial feedback was this, but now there's been some other, you know, other opposition, I don't say opposition, but other input that says that maybe we should try to relook at this. So we're going to try and salvage some value of this, but the other alternatives is uh, is the best way to, uh, you know, to, and have a have more of a, I think, a united, you know, uh, uh, a succinct plan on the ninth to say, look, this is, you know, based on what we were doing, this was what we thought was. But these are the other elements that we'd like to incorporate as part of this. And can we, you know, they may give you a timeline and say, look, we need this resolved by, you know, April. Because because if you don't have it resolved by April, then it, it's going to do this and then things are going to, you know what I mean? So it, I'll, I'll be able to get some feedback from them over the next couple days. Excellent. I did inform them after I went to the, his, the Historic District Commission a few weeks ago, you know, in November, um, that there was some, you know, discussion about the marathon and the closing of this. and. There might be some, you know, some alternatives that might need to be relooked at, and um, you know, and they just said we just need the town to kind of make a decision, type of thing, and uh, and like I said, I'll I'll get the the feedback from them over the next couple of days. Well, I guess what I'm suggesting is that we try to have that meeting and make some kind of decision, one way or the other. If it's this, great. I mean, I personally am quite flexible about all this, but if this is the decision, great. If there's another decision, great, but let's try and get that organized before the night. And I'll reach out to the chair. After we get the letter, I'll reach out to the chair of the Historic District and see if we can. We will ask for the letter tomorrow. Yes. Excellent. Um, if I may, uh, you know, assuming what Mr. Burchard says, you know, April is when you really have everything buttoned up. I mean, according to the process, um, what the Historic District recommended to move forward back when I don't know when it was December when they picked number five it was just it was just kind of a, a recommendation but when you do anything in the district there is a process where an application has to be submitted and the district commission has to meet and hold a public hearing and approve it and the town is the applicant and put down in DOT and the board has to decide so that hasn't happen yet and I think everyone's understanding that the town will go through the same procedure that any other resident would the thing to do is to have an understanding of what plan we're working with and then go through the well, formal did they do process that for, did they do that for this process no they did not no there was did never they, an application this is submitted. this is a preliminary design preliminary. no 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 they, no but but we haven't we wouldn't petition the historic district commission to make a change in and anything until we got through this public hearing right. process in the feedback the, the information that we heard yeah. back from the historic district commission and you know on the the five alternatives was they thought this was one that they supported and you know based on 
you know, improvements to the common, extend, you know, expanding the common, protecting the doughboy, and, and a couple other items okay. were, were, you know, at least, and I, and I have that in, you know, kind of like some of their notes from, from the meeting that was held several months ago. So that's the one that we, you know, the board and, and or with that the um, town and uh, the chamber kind of said, all right, right, let's we're going to move forward with this based on this feedback. Um, I'm not saying it's set in stone that we, we can't do that, you know, and I, and I spoke with, uh, you know, Claire asked me about that when we, and we were at the Historic District Commission meeting, and I said, there are alternatives here. I said, because it does rise up because of the, the permitting side of the project. There's federal funds, so it needs to go through a Section 106 on the feds have to approve of any changes in the Historic District Commission as well, and then the Mass Historic Commission has to weigh in, his, uh, weigh in on the process. But those would happen after the public hearing so it's like a preliminary you kind of it's like a trial balloon you float it up there and you say is everyone still on board with this before we start to really mm -hmm. tighten up and this is how we're going to do it and if there's and i you know i've used the term we can tweak it because this was seemed like it had support if we have to go to one of the other four alternatives and then it's it's addressing some other items um you know i, I still consider that to be a tweak of solving um, historic assets of the Commonwealth in the town and making sure we have safe pedestrian access, safe uh, bicycle access, and you know, a few other things. Okay. But I, you know. But what I want to say, the, cl uh, the clarification is when we reach that point that Mr. Burchard is talking about, when we know what we're doing with and we've got it designed and everybody's on board with what the plan is. The procedure is the town is no different than any other applicant. An application must be submitted by the town to the historic district for a certificate of appropriateness to be issued. And at that point, they vote on it and issue a certificate of appropriateness. And anything in the district cannot go forward until a certificate of appropriateness has been issued by the district commission from an application. And that will happen when we know exactly the plan we're moving forward. Again, thank you for the information. We have some work to do before the public hearing. We will uh, be in touch with the Historic District Commission uh, as early as tomorrow. Uh, we look forward to receiving their comments and we will take it from there. I, we have a great relationship with Mass DOT. We've already started this conversation with Mass DOT and hopefully we will have some agreement prior to January 9th next year. I feel very strongly that we can come to some general consensus about how to do this by January 9th if we do some work between now and then. So my message as one member would be to anybody you're talking to, we'll figure it out. There might be a couple of tweaks here. Okay. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much, John, Dave. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, guys. You. Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, let's, um, uh, oh, here's another short one. Annual town meeting. The Board of Scott will consider opening the annual town meeting warrant on or before January 7, 2018, and closing the warrant on February 6, 2018. And um, and then also the Board of Select will conclude its discussion of potential a annual town meeting articles, including the general bylaw changes, so staff may present drafts to the next meeting and commence its review of the draft nuisance bylaw. Yeah. And that's a uh, Mr. Hurry, you asked uh, for that one. It's in the packet. Mr. Chair, in the interest of time, I move that the Board of Selectmen open the annual town meeting warrant uh, on or before January 7, 2018, and then close the warrant. And then the warrant will then close on February 6, 2018. Sorry. Okay, do you want to pick a date, second, third, or fourth? Otherwise, we'll open it on a Sunday. Of January. Of January. Mr. Kamal, I'm sorry. January 2nd. January 2nd. January 2nd. The 7th is a Sunday. Oh, so right, it's the 2nd. After New Year's. January 2nd, sorry. Okay, okay so, is that, so you, are you, are you uh, okay with the friendly amendment? I guess so. Okay, great. <laughs> right. And so we got a second? We got a second. Could I offer a comment? So, one, Mr. Kamal, the motion's in order? Yes, specifically okay. identifying when the town meeting will open and when it will close. A warrant for the town meeting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Uh, secondly, um, the dates of the opening and closing, at least the closing following the opening, are accurate and, and there's enough time there? 
they are accurate insofar as February 6 reflects the new language in the town charter, which is 90 days before the annual town meeting. Because it's not very long between the 2nd and the 6th. Yeah, it's, a month. it's a month and a couple of days, which I thought would typically be longer. Yeah. I'm okay with being shorter, given what we spent a lot of time on earlier tonight, talking budgets. Uh, okay. I'm all set. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, how do you vote? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Passes. Okay. Um, do you want to discuss uh, any uh, annual town meeting articles and general bylaw changes? We've got the, uh, in, in, our, in our packet is that, uh, is that nuisance bylaw that uh, came up last year that uh, um, we uh, made some modifications to and uh, put it out to town meeting, but uh, the full, the f uh, all the changes are on here now uh, that we were considering last year that uh, didn't make it through. I have to find my packet open again, so I'm sorry. Yeah, so could you refresh my memory on the events around this last year? Um, well, last year it, it was uh, kicked from, oh, uh, actually maybe you can give me give a better timeline. So uh, last uh, winter, um, when the zoning bylaw, zoning advisory committee was doing their work, they looked at a, um, a nuisance provision both in the zoning and in the general bylaws as alternative. And this draft they developed in February of last year. Um, they sent it to the planning board and the planning board said, uh, we don't do general bylaws and forwarded it to the board of selectmen. Um, they simultaneously reviewed the zoning provision and decided not to proceed with that. So this then came to the board and then uh, you proceeded to work that through your process and it changed into the construction debris bylaw that we have. Okay. And so this just came back up because... Um, so it hasn't been changed since February 21st. So we've got it in here. What was the discussion around it? What didn't... Because it was... Same we didn't have much people, people, right? right same no, five people. Uh, yeah, we didn't have much time. Um, we basically had, uh, I think, two meetings, or maybe even just one, to uh, to look over the entire. And then it went to town meeting, and it got shredded at town meeting as well. So, mm -hmm. for parts of it, anyway. Right, and so that's why it ended up being the construction the one that actually yeah. went and got through yeah so I think so did it go to town meeting in this form no no, no. okay the, the, the board of selectmen discussions narrowed the focus of the bylaw from one that was broad to one that was purely limited to construction debris that is brought from off-site mm -hmm. to a residency And so that's why now everybody's got the, got the full nuisance bylaw in their packet. I don't know what the answer is, Mr. Chair. Um, I find this issue to be very frustrating to me <coughs> personally. We all have property rights. I get it. But when one person's property rights destroy the property value of the budding person, that's a problem. I don't know what the answer is because I get that we all have property rights. But I can't believe in Hopkinton, Massachusetts today, we allow people to hang massive tarps between their properties to screen one from another and to hide the junk that's on their property. It just, the whole thing is nonsensical to me. So I don't know what the answer is. I'm very frustrated by it. And I just wish we, we got to keep working on it. Well, There's got to be a solution out well, there. We, we haven't it, found it. We've got it right here. This, this one is actually, this, this bylaw was based on Upton's. And it passed. Uh, it passed it. Their uh, So this is a draft that we're looking at. This is a draft. Uh, this is a draft that that um, came through um, zoning advisory committee. Worked with uh, Ms. Lazarus. That that was based on Upton's nuisance bylaw. And uh, because it's this is one of those things you don't try and do from scratch. And, and I don't think it's something we're going to be able to get to tonight, no. given our temperament no. at the moment and no. <laughs> the time. But I would just encourage all of us, if, if you don't understand why I'm frustrated by this or you don't think we need this, take a ride down Ash Street, 
visit a couple of properties there, drive down Blueberry Road or Lane. Road Lane, mm -hmm. and look at a couple of properties there, and then let's come back and talk about it. Because what you will see does not belong in Hopkinton, Massachusetts, or any, nobody should have to put up with it. And I want to say, I remember some of the concerns last year. And what I want to make sure, and this seems to be an improvement from what I read. Some of the concerns were, I understand what you're saying, Brian, but if you're on the other side, what if you're innocent? What if this is a neighbor issue? That one neighbor trying to get after another neighbor. Sometimes it's one man's trash is another man's treasure. The last, the last one, it had everything to do with something needing a little paint or a window being fixed. It, it had the opportunity for, I think of older residents that maybe don't have the money to keep their property in ship shape or there's a little shed that needs paint. You know, is it really an eyesore or is it a neighbor trying to use a bylaw to carry out a neighborhood spat? I want to make sure that this is structured in such a way that I, there there is some room for a judgment call to be made by a building inspector. Is this really egregious, or is this or is this you know a neighborhood issue? Is it viewable? Is it seen from the public view, or do you have to look over somebody's back fence and complain about their pile of bricks and your Ashley? You just got a, an, an axe to grind with your neighbor. Um, what was in last year's as well was very heavy-handed that the immediately as soon as the complaint was filed there would be a fine and if you appealed it you'd go through appeal process but the fines continued and I thought you know there are seniors that maybe have an older home and they don't take care of it perfectly if all of a sudden there's a $25 a day fine that's building up I mean and they're living on Social Security check or a fixed income you you could be just creating all sorts of real trauma for somebody who maybe doesn't realize or doesn't have the resources. Can this be worked out between the building inspector and the homeowner? There have to be different levels of enforcement and room for some level of just decency and reasonableness. And, and then if it doesn't get resolved, then you go the next level. Um, I remember last year I felt it was heavy-handed and somewhat arbitrary and didn't really provide for a level of um, reasonableness. It's the exact same one. I, I, I want to make sure that I, that's yeah. there. So I don't want this to be used against yes. someone. No, no, I, I get it. Th th but that's why I wanted to bring to the board exactly what we brought last year, mm -hmm. so that we could uh, maybe we're seeing it with different eyes this, this year. But I wanted to make sure that people had had enough time to look at it. You know, mm -hmm. The, the um, zoning advisory committee is is still in session for for one more meeting. Uh, I believe on the fifth or something, fourth, fifth. Um, I, I think those are all very valid points, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Wright. I really do. I mean, I if just you think we got to keep working to find a solution. Right, right. If but I, I like, if, if you don't agree, there should be room for appeal, and the fines don't start well, to kick in until it's resolved. Could you, uh, um, could you enlighten us about the, the fines? We asked you that on on Zach, of how often fines are uh, are levied against. Uh, People don't really recall the last time a fine was, was levied. That right. so usually things are worked out um, well, between if, people. If there's room people. for things to be worked out, that's important mm -hmm. as opposed to just the end. Right. So, so we don't do that. Bucks but a day. I know, even though it's written in here, we don't do that in this town. Well, you know, it, 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 it's in here. We, we, no, that, that came up because we actually, uh, on, on Zach. Glad could, we're spending so much time on this then. <laughs> well, no, well, we had to because last year, last year we. We, we weren't going to. We, didn't, we, we did spend time on it and reduced it to... Well, I don't think we should really get into it tonight because this can be a pretty big issue. But I would strongly... It takes five minutes to drive down Blueberry Road. Check this out. But Brian, the reason, why, this the the reason why we're talking about it is because we had a woman in front of us and you demanded I agree. that we do something about it this week. And so that's why it's on you, because you wanted it this week. And that's why we're putting, giving some time to it, and we, you know, and, and so we'll give it some time, and then we can look it over and bring it up on the 16th again. But um, we were, that's why I wanted to make sure that we absolutely had it here, because you were saying to me, Mr. Chairman, we have to send her away with, with something. And so this is what we brought up last year, and we reduced it to construction debris. Now, if we want to, if we, if we want to, Put some more teeth in, into the construction debris, or put this one through. Let's do it. But otherwise, 
we can't just we can't just use it as as you know as FaceTime to say to people we we, we think All right. I appreciate you putting it on tonight's agenda, and I support some form of a nuisance bylaw being presented to town meeting this year as a general bylaw that has some more teeth in it than what we put forward last year. So I appreciate you doing that, but we're not going to figure it out tonight. No, no, but, where, where do, what, but again, where and when are we going to refine it? That, 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 that. Well, I think some of us want to take a look at the bylaw and get a little bit more information back to the town manager and we we'll go from there. We've got till March. Here's an offer. We can work on a draft and present it to the board on January 16th. And board members, in between, now and January 16, feel free to call us with your input. Well, I mean, okay. I, I just got to say that whenever I, it, if I have a concern and somebody says to me, well, that's because it, it never would happen and we never do that. It's never going to happen. That, that doesn't satisfy me. I mean, as long as the potential is there to say, but it would never happen, that, that doesn't cut it. Um, no, but I wanted to. I wanted to yeah. leave your fears that that, yeah. that people are, are hit with the three hundred dollar fine immediately, because again, it, you know, it, it, in recent memory, they have not. They I have know. Not been any, I know. Any fine. I know. But, but we do have to look at this. The potential is there. Then the potential yes. is still there. Last but year, last year, you said that we didn't have enough time to look at it. We did. So now we have we have four weeks. Right. We have four weeks to look at this before mm -hmm. January sixteenth mm -hmm. and get and get information back to uh, the town manager. And I did notice that under state law, relative to buildings, the selectman already under Chapter 139, Section 1, has the ability um, if it's a dilapidated building. It doesn't cover things like the junk pile. But well, Chapter 139, Section 1. What does what Mr. Herr may consider dilapidated versus what I may, or Mr. Catino, or you, or Mr. Sestari, is subjective. Well, I'm just saying it's already in okay. the state law that the selectmen right, so, have the ability. All right, so don't, okay, we're, we're, let's, let's end discussion on this right now. And let's move, okay, so uh, in the interest of time now, we're, we have four weeks, we'll, we'll, we'll get, get everybody get their information to the town manager's office. Okay, uh, board liaison reports and board invite. Were there, this, this item on the agenda wasn't only specific to that, was oh. it? Um, the board selectman will conclude its Oh, yeah, well, this was the only discussion. Did we start? We, yeah, we did. Oh, we did. We did. Annual town meeting yeah, we did last week. Yeah, yeah, this was the only one that came up. So, Mr. Yeah, Chair, in order to take action based on the fact that you got it on the agenda for this evening, and I do appreciate that, I move that the Board of Selectmen support some form of a general bylaw to go on the warrant for the 2018 annual town meeting specific to the nuisance, specific to the nuisance bylaw process or discussion. I'm gonna abstain yeah. from that. It's not specific enough. I'm not gonna agree to anything if, that I don't have the specifics in front of me. Okay. How about I mean, what's it mean to say I've, I approve some form. I mean, we're going to have to go through and specify the form, and then I could disagree with that. Well, no, no, the, the actual, no, Brian's not, not that off. It, it, it's, it's the, um, including any gen, general bylaw changes so that the staff may present drafts at the next meeting. So it is, it is what, uh, what Norman was talking about. Because we have, we have, a, we have a draft in front of us now. We're going to make changes to it, and then he's going to present another draft to us at, 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 in four weeks. Okay. Okay, so. That's fine. If, if, if he's going to do that, then there doesn't need to be a motion yeah. to make him do that. Yeah. I'm okay with that. I withdraw my motion. Okay. Ill-advised Ill advised motion. I second. I withdraw my dissension. <laughs> but not my tone of voice. <laughs> Okay, this was this was one feisty meeting, you guys. Okay, all right. So there's nothing else we need to discuss <laughs> so about it. Were there, other were there any articles? Well, does, yeah, does yeah. anybody have any articles they want to bring up? That's you know, th uh, we asked that last week, and um, this was the only one that came up. Do you have any? I'm good, Mr. Kamalo. Is there anything else? That yeah. we yes. Um, we have two, uh, and potentially three. <laughs> um, one is. We're talking with our special cable council 
with regard to some recent case law developments. Um, it appears the town may need to approve an, or to consider an article uh, that will designate the use of the funds that we receive through the cable licensing process. We're still looking into that. Um, and as we want to get your care from the board to continue looking into that and have that as a potential article. That's one. The second issue is we've also received feedback from our auditors, from the town's new auditors, uh, that we may need to take an additional step in approving the OPEP trust fund. Mm. And we're discussing that issue with the town council. And then the third issue which came up, I think, from the discussion earlier is uh, the need to create a revolving fund for the new fields. So we're putting the board on notice that we may we may have that on the on the warrant. Anything anything on um, fire station or any of that kind of stuff? We have to talk about that. Um, land purchases come as part of the budget process. Okay. And we're gonna in the, in the research on that revolving fund, we're going to verify that we can set it up where it would be uh, paying for the construction costs, construction loan. Y yes, in, in, in fact, a related issue that didn't come up earlier tonight, but I was thinking of during the discussion, is that uh, this is a partnership between the school department and an enterprise department, and how do we commingle the two? So as we go, as he goes through that process, I don't see the revenue coming in paid, paying the full construction note, but I think a portion of the construction note is doable, and I think not so a bad idea. So the other part would be the other part would be raised by private funds. Private funds, taxpayers. I mean, we can piece it all together, but I would be uncomfortable saying let's set up this revolving fund article. It says it's going to pay you the construction note for the fields because I just don't know if the revenues that can pay that kind of note. I mean, but well, a portion of the construction note would make sense. And that portion then can be a buck or it can be, yeah. Well, grand. I mean, I think you know, this that conversation can take place when we have more time, right? But, uh, but I would think that if it was going to be enough to fund the resurfacing in 10 years. I don't know how long the note for the construction is going to be, whether it's going to be 10 years or 15 or 20, but um, you know the uh, you, you should be able to, if it's 20 especially, should be able to fund So that. let's explore it, but, be, yeah. but just say pay the note, I don't know if that's doable. Let's explore all options to pay the note. Eligible. The funds in there are eligible to pay the note yeah. is what I'm saying. Okay. And if I may, too, it's not unusual for the board to ask Again, going back to the enterprise fund to repay the general fund on some of these projects. The board has done that before. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Kamala, We're supposed to have done that before. When, too. when I spoke of that park department, um, the school committee said that they don't have any discretion over that. Um, I'd like to explore to see without saying it on camera, I, I'd like to explore to see what we need to do to get that underway. Yeah. Or to do a charter review. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it that can means be taking, taking That means taking everything from the DPW, that means taking everything from the school, Yes. and putting it so we have a director of park, you know, the, the Parks and Rec, whether it's Jay Gelfi that, that handles the business end, and you hire, you know, Mr. Green Jeans to, to make sure that the grass is, is up to par everywhere that knows what they're doing and we don't run into um, you know that the, the common stays as pristine as it is and the, and the cemeteries look good and the uh, fruit street fields and the, the uh, turf field is maintained as well as the high school you know I, I think it's important to have someone in here that knows what they're doing to to oversee the entire thing and to allocate the funds appropriately to to have that and to make sure that the area at the water towers is 
green and the area around the, the tennis courts look nice and the fruit street and, and everywhere so um, and I think you need one entity to, to manage all that uh, just like most towns do uh, and I'd like to see what we need to do to get that underway it, it, it can be done by agreement and not necessarily through a charter change uh, we've gone down this road before Brian you know <laughs> so I love it. I love the yeah. idea. We'd yeah. have to get our colleagues at the school committee to, to love it and Parks and Rec as well. Yeah. But didn't the school committee just say that they have nothing to do with it? <laughs> no, they have nothing to do with initiating the idea. Yeah. The creation of the department. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But they have, they have, they have a lot to say about, about the facilities okay. that they're yeah. currently controlling. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Um, board liaison uh, reports. All mine were covered here tonight. I know mine too. So we had a, a, a really good meeting the other day at the elementary school building committee. Uh, they're, they're significantly under budget at this point, um, and they're, they're um, you know they've met all their benchmarks as far as the time time goes. Uh, it's coming along nicely, and we're looking to continue to stay under budget and, and stay tight. Excellent. Um, I heard that the Cultural Council got together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and what can you report from that meeting? <laughs> uh, they got some new people to join. That's <laughs> right. Uh, no, nothing new that I didn't report from this meeting. All right. Future, future board agenda items. Anybody have anything? I have a wrestling ring. Okay. That's great. Everybody, hey, thank you very much, everybody, for, for joining us tonight. We should see if we can get kind of fun and feisty at your time. Motion to adjourn. Okay. I'd just like to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We'll be back on January 16th, same time, same channel. Aye. 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 Any, any opposed, any abstentions? Motion passes. We'll be Thank you very much. Thank you. Merry Christmas.